Hello, welcome to the Opta Planner Week, the first community event fully focused on business optimization with resource plan uh, with a resource. <laughs> The first community event fully focused on resources optimization with OptaPlanner. So I am super glad to have you here. I am Karina Varela and I'm going to be with you throughout the whole week along with great experts on the matter of optimization. We have here already on the backstage a couple of important people like the next presenter and the lead of the Opta Planner project. But before we call them to stage, let's first understand how the event's going to roll. So uh, this event is going to happen throughout three days and we are going to have a couple of talks each day. So we are going to start at 10 a.m. EST which is 4 p.m. CST. So we will start with the event opening just to learn, like just to hear about the daily agenda and have a small chat with the guys. Uh, then we should start with a more high level talk covering business use cases or how you can get started with some uh, implementation, something more light so that we can warm up the engines, and then we can go for a technical talk. So this is going to be a more middle level talk where we are going to get more techie, more hands on. And then we will go to a deep dive technical session where we will talk about hardcore stuff, things for people who already uses Opta Planner and needs to like drill down into the, those complicated stuff or if have been through trouble in production with us uh, some uh, difficult problems. So this is the moment you have to interact with these presenters. We will be sharing their knowledge, but we will also be live following the comments so we can talk. This is not consulting time, but we'll be here to chat with you. <laughs> so for today, so let me just open here my comment section. Hey, Lucas, Christian, Angel, Benjamin. Hi, everyone from France, US, Greece. Tell us where you're coming from. So I'm in Brazil now and it's great. Masaiko from Tokyo, Japan. It's nice to see you here, Sweden. Hello, hello to everyone. Morning, afternoon. It's really good to have you here. The intention of this event is to have to, to network so we can all get together and talk. So this is the fun of it. It's not meant to be a recorded session. We are meant to be here live together chatting. So this is the fun about it. Maybe after this tough time that we are going through, we can get together somewhere on the globe for some meetups, but for now, let's just uh, let's just uh, gather here. Belgium, Chennai, I'm so excited to have you all here today. And uh, let's see what we're going to have for the day. We will start with Duncan Doyle telling us how we can kickstart our Opta Planner project. How can we identify patterns and common practices to be used? So you've heard about optimization. You want to get started, but you don't know how. You have all that, those quick start, those quick start guides, but you don't know how to actually get your hands dirty and get things ongoing. Duncan is going to tell us how we can do that. Then we will go for a 10 minutes break where we're actually just Chat a little bit, grab your coffee, get some water before we have Jerry Locker talking about vehicle routing with Opta Planner, followed by Christopher Cianelli telling us how we can identify deficient resources by visualizing in dictaments. If then we'll, you will be able to again have a chat with all these experts. And here I'm telling you, we have the best Opta Planner experts in the world in this event this week. So I strongly recommend you to stay with us until the end. We will close up 
with our architects and engineers from Red Hat who are specialized on trusty AI, and they will tell us how we can combine these two technologies, how we can combine trusty AI and, solution, and resource planning solutions with OptaPlanner, how we can combine this stuff. So it is going to be an exciting day, guys and girls from everywhere in the globe. Good. So I want to invite, before I, I, we start anything, I'd like to invite to stage our speaker, who is Duncan Doyle. Duncan Doyle is today a product manager from the Application Services Initiative in Red Hat. He has a really strong background with all business automation, with the, all the business automation stack. So he's a hardcore drooler, a hardcore process automation guy. He's like, he's Duncan Doyle. I don't have to say anything. Welcome to stage, Duncan. Thank oh, you for man. joining us in this event. Thanks, Karina. Happy to be here again. It's great <laughs> and a great introduction yeah. again. A lot of enthusiasm, and I'm happy to see uh, so many friends from all over the world uh, joining us here. I saw uh, even Australia from Adelaide, Australia. So uh, it's uh, it's every time zone you can imagine is is watching this. So that's great. This is perfect, and we cannot miss our OptaPlanner lead, Geoffrey Desmet. Hey, Geoffrey, welcome to stage. Hey, Karina. Thank you. This is very exciting. I'm looking forward to this week. Right? Hey, Wufu Duncan. Hi from Germany, Colombia, Mexico, Italy. I cannot speak all these languages. I can only speak like Portuguese and English. I should practice. <laughs> yeah, so it's it, it, it's only practice. It's not that difficult. But uh, hey, Jeffrey, would you have ever expected? That's my first question before we dive into this uh, this session of mine. Would you have ever expected that when you started this project, I think back in two thousand and six, uh, that you would ever have your own OptiPlanner Week virtual session three days in a row talking about your baby? No, not really. But uh, it was always the plan, right? Um, uh, make uh, optimization uh, so easy that everybody can use it. I don't think we're there yet. We're on our way, uh, but um, it's a long-term plan and uh, make it, you know, a commodity for everybody to use. So, your yeah. baby. So you treat it like your baby. <laughs> a little bit different from my real kids, of course, but uh, it is, you know, there's a few things important in my life, my kids and my project, so, and my wife, of course. And your wife, yes, that's what I want no. to say. You, you know that this is recorded, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I usually start the other way around. But, okay, good. Um, for the record, uh, you know, wife goes for your head. <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll get it. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, you... Uh, who's watching us now, we are going to have this recorded and available in, at YouTube later so you can watch it all over again. And we are going to split the sessions too so you can have the specific talk you want to watch also in its own video so you can just share it with anyone you'd like to. So I'm happy to have this. Colombia, Argentina. And now we have to do the YouTube thingy, right, Karina? Right? subscribe and press the like button yes I wanted to do if that. you're excited as we are just hit the like button that <laughs> and hit the subscribe too <laughs> joffrey don't do this to me you know i'm excited today right yeah that's so brilliant. <laughs> guys tell me opta planner in production duncan has a, a really fun story because i asked him okay duncan like, when can an OptiPlanner project go wrong? And what was your answer? Do you remember? Like, the, the, the project where it went wrong? I, I don't recall the ex exact answer that I gave, I have to say. So you have to help me there. But uh, uh, from experience, that, that can, it can go wrong from day one. That's what our first talk is no, going to no, be no, about. No. You told me that the only use case where it went wrong was it, uh, when it optimized too well. So people were that's getting true. like no no that's no, that's that that's true we have had cases where where the optimization went uh, was was too good uh, that it was actually not allowed from uh, governmental regulations and 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 union union regulations and so forth that's a, that's a true story yes that's correct yeah. and we might actually dive into that uh, a bit in uh, in this talk to uh, to go through a, a number of those uh, those concerns yes correct yeah. this is perfect thank you Duncan so please share your screen. 
We're going to try, eh? We're going to try. Start your talk. Good. Perfect that you are recording this. I was already afraid to miss the last session. You will not miss anything. It will be all, it will all be available for you later, okay? Duncan, I can see your screen and I will share it. Geoffrey, let's go to the backstage. Follow me. I'll show you the path. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks again for the uh, intro, uh, Karina. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, as Karina said, uh, I'll, a brief introduction. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Duncan. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I've been at Red Hat uh, for almost 10 years now in uh, in various roles and currently a, a product manager in the application services division. But I started out in uh, consulting, actually middleware consulting uh, around a lot of the JBoss uh, uh, products, so enterprise application platform, uh, BRMS, data grid, um, uh, messaging systems, and so forth. And that was when I came across uh, this uh, this I think hidden gem in 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 our Red Hat portfolio, but uh, in general in the open source community called OptiPlanner. And so I became sort of an SME on the OptiPlanner project as well. I've been delivering trainings uh, across the globe on OptiPlanner, doing presentations, and uh, a a a commit here and there on the uh, on the on the code base whenever uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, was so kind to actually accept my PRs. So what we're going to talk about today is um, in my my Red Hat journey, I've I've uh, worked with a lot of of customers, with a lot of clients, and uh, especially in my in my consulting days. And the interesting part, I think, is is the, the sort of things I learned during those OptiPlanner projects when going to customers that had embarked on an OptiPlanner project, uh, got stuck or, or needed help to get more value out of, out of OptiPlanner itself. And from those experiences, I've collected a number of I think common topics or common patterns that, that, that we've seen almost at every customer that could um, really inhibit uh, you making the progress with OptiPlanner that you want. So OptiPlanner is, is a Great project. It's 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 awesome technology, and and it can provide you with a lot you and your organization with a lot of value. But if you don't make the right choices and the right decisions, and 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 think about the right architecture and ask the right questions from day one, you can get yourself into a situation where you you don't get out of OptiPlanner what 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 you want or, or what is actually what you're able to get out of OptiPlanner. So. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'll give a brief introduction for the people. I, I, I assume that everybody, because they're signing up for OptiPlanner, we, uh, has a basic understanding of what OptiPlanner is. Given that this is a more of a high-level overview and not a, a deep dive, as Karina pointed out, uh, I just want to give you a high-level overview of, of what OptiPlanner is aims to do what it tries to do uh, and what problems it tries to solve and after that we'll go into uh, a number of uh, uh, areas of uh, that you need to take care of when starting or embarking on an OptiPlanner project. So first of all what's a planning problem? So OptiPlanner is a, a library, a platform, a utility to uh, a, a, a technology uh, to uh, find optimal solutions or, or best solutions for a what we call non-solvable problems within a given uh, time frame and with a within a given set of resources. So the first question then arises, what's a planning problem? And basically a planning problem consists of three things. Uh, first, you want to optimize goals and we will, can discuss later what those goals can be, but you want to optimize goals uh, with limited resources uh, under constraint. So the limited resources is important because if you have unlimited resources like unlimited money, unlimited cars, unlimited uh, cargo space, you don't really have a problem, right? So you have to deal with limited resources. And the under constraints part is 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 uh, important because problems, solutions to problems, there there are usually various constraints. For example, if you look at vehicle routing, uh, a, a driver cannot drive a truck 24 hours a day. So there's constraint there. There, a, a, a certain truck can only carry a certain load of cargo. So there is a constraint there. Uh, people are not allowed to work more than five consecutive days uh, from uh, government law and regulation. So there's a constraint there. So those are the three main concerns in, an, in a planning problem. Optimize goals, limited resources under constraints. So the value proposition of 
of the planner, if we look at a number of examples to show the value proposition, for example, look at, if we look at the vehicle routing problem, we can see, and Yuri is going to talk about this problem in more detail in the next session, so make sure to attend that one as well. Um, the 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 goal here in vehicle routing could be it could be multiple actually it could be to minimize fuel consumption it could be to minimize driving time it could be to minimize the required vehicles it could be to be more environmental friendly be to because you're using uh, less fuel and so forth uh, then the resources in this problem could be vehicles and deliveries and they have a capacity in fuel and constraints could be uh, as I said, you can have only have eight hours consecutive driving time, or you have to arrive before the due time. For example, in package delivery, if you said you, you'll deliver the package before 4 p.m., you have to deliver it before 4 p.m. And as I said before, vehicles can have a certain capacity. So that's an example of different goals, resources, and constraints for this specific problem. If you then look at what OptoPlanner offers, is that based on real benchmarks, so we, we, we compete a lot with OptoPlanner in, in academic competitions, and we do a lot of benchmarks marking on the platform as well. What you can see that is that based on, on real benchmark uh, uh, values, we can see that versus traditional algorithms, we can improve driving time, for example, in the vehicle routing problem by 15%. Now, 15% might not sound much, but if you have a business that um, spends multi millions of dollars or euros or yen or whatever currency your country is using on uh, uh, shipping goods and, and, and routing goods using vehicles, then saving 15% of a multi multi-million expense is, 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 is significant. And the interesting, the other interesting part is that all the planners usually sort of presumed as being sort of a niche uh, 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 product. But what's interesting is, is that a lot of companies actually have these problems. So for example, vehicle routing problem is extremely common. For example, supermarkets, retail stores, uh, restaurant chains, uh, uh, for example, freight transportation, buses, taxis, airlines, uh, technicians that you have to send on the road to help people out with, 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 with your product at, at on sites. Uh, it's all vehicle routing. So there's a very big area of use cases in a uh, multitude of of, uh, uh, of areas um, that can really benefit from optimizing on vehicle routing. Uh, another example is employee rostering, for example, where you have to increase your employees' well-being. So this could be something for uh, nurse rostering or assignment of security guards or uh, police departments, fire departments, and so forth. Uh, constraints could be that you only can work one shift per day. You have to have required skills for that specific shift. Uh, might be that you want to go on vacation and that you request days off. That has implications for a, uh, a sh schedule. That has implications for roster. And Auto Planner can also help you with creating those kind of plans and optimizing those kind of plans to improve, for example, in this case, uh, employee well-being. And as I said, use cases could be hospitals. Uh, we had an in, uh, interesting employee rostering uh, uh, problem now with the COVID situation where we were able to use the existing rostering and, 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 and scheduling uh, application and add COVID-19 rules uh, or constraints uh, to that uh, to that. Uh, system to better optimize the shift assignment for nurses and doctors. So for example, not to mix people within different shifts and so forth, to minimize the contact points between different groups of people. So that's also an interesting uh, uh, constraint in this use case that, that's sort of very applicable actually in, this, uh, in these times. Um, and what you need to know is that OptiPlanner is not a, uh, a, a single purpose or a single use case uh, uh, product. It, 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 it looks at, it optimizes, it's created to optimize various sorts of, of problems. And these problems are, are everywhere. If you have a more of an IT or, or, or a mathematic academic background, you might have heard of uh, a problem space called MP complete or MP hard problems. And, and what we know from that space is that you can basically transform any of those those uh, problems into one another. And and OptiPlanner can solve uh, once you configure and, and implement correctly can solve various of these problems like job shop scheduling, vehicle routing, bin packing, equipment scheduling, uh, and so forth and so forth. So it's a, applicable in a, a lot of vertical industries and in, in a lot of use cases. 
So that for a short introduction about OptiPlanner and the, uh, the value proposition, I'm sure you will hear more about that in the remainder of this week and the other talks as well. Uh, but let's now look at the uh, at, at some of the things that I have seen uh, personally with a number of my colleagues. I actually see them uh, in, the, in the chat right here. Hello, Paolo. Uh, uh, some of the things that we've seen at uh, at uh, at customers and and where we think where we came in as as Red Hat as a company as we uh, uh, provide support for uh, for OptiPlanner within our offerings, where we came in to uh, uh, use our consulting and and help uh, all uh, uh, our customers to uh, improve their OptiPlanner projects and some of the problems we've seen in the past. So there's uh, these are the topics that I want to go through. Uh, first of all, the domain modeling. We're going to look a bit at the benchmarker, a different score calculation type, environment, environment modes, and so forth and so forth. It's a quick overview, and we'll dive into more detail on these topics. So first of all, domain modeling. As I said before, AutoPlanner is a general purpose constraint solver. So it's an artificial intelligence. It, a constraint solving is a subsection of, of AI. So a lot of people think that AI is equivalent to machine learning. Well, it's actually not. Uh, Constraint solvers, which is the category of technology that, that OptiPlanner falls into, is also a subset of, of AI focused at solving these unsolvable problems, so to say. So what you need to do in an OptiPlanner project is actually model your problem domain. So in vehicle routing, there could be vehicles. In, in a shift assignment, that could be employees. It could be shifts. Uh, it could be skill sets, and so forth and so forth. And what we see, and this is already a, not a very high level slide, I have to say. But what I want to point out here is that depending on the domain model that you choose, depending on the model uh, that you, you create, you can create either bad models or, or good models. And, and bad models usually are models that are ideally, either create a, uh, a problem space or a solution space that is too big. So even with OptiPlanner, there are models that create a solution space in which there's so many combinations of a, of a solution that even a a a, a library or, or or a technology like OptiPlanner can't solve that anymore. That that is possible, uh, but it can also cause that you create a solution space that's so big that you really don't get the the the, the benefit and the value out of OptiPlanner that you could have if you would have chosen a model which would be better applicable for your use case, where you would have a a smaller solution space so OptiPlanner can give you a better optimization of your problem at hand. Uh, this is one of the slides that actually comes out of the uh, Opti planner uh, uh, um, I think it's the off the planner learning slides around there on off the planner.org and what we see here is that this is for in this example we're looking at the shift assignment problem or the employee rostering problem and what we can see here is that basically depending on how we choose what kind of entity in our model is the planning entity and which one is the planning variable we can create either a model that or in which the solution space is way too big, or a model that's actually a good model and that gives us the best results. So again, I will not go into details here, but there's there's more research. Actually, the OptiPlanner manual has a very, very good section about domain modeling. So when you start embarking on your OptiPlanner journey, you start writing your domain model, this is one of the more most critical things that you have to get right. So make sure that you invest time into this, make sure that you analyze your problem, make sure that you analyze this, this space of your solution, the number of combinations of your of your uh, of your planning problem to make sure that you create the best model possible. And even us experts sometimes have trouble uh, 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 getting that model right. So even under ourselves within our organization, we we tend to ask for feedback when we've designed designed a model and say, well, can you have a second look here and 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 maybe give some tips and tricks on on how to improve this. Um, so I'll go not go into into detail about this uh, this slide, but what what is uh, uh, um, interesting is that if you look at the solution space or the search space for an OptiPlanner project, uh, the numbers really are mind blowing. So for example, if you look at so 
this is an example of a uh, uh, a cloud balancing problem where you have to assign a number of computer processes to a number of computers with a certain set of resources. And this slide we show that if you have 300 computer processes that you can assign to 100 different computers, the actual number of possible con combinations is 100 to the power of 300. Um, that's equivalent to 10 to the power of 600. And that really doesn't probably tell you anything. Uh, but if you uh, know that the number of uh, atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the power of 80, so 10 to the power of 80, and you see that this problem already has a solution space of 10 to the power of 600. You can sort of see how important it is to not make that solution space any bigger than is, uh, than is necessary. And the size of the search space for different domains, for different domain models is, is, is different. So here's an example for cloud balancing, uh, an example for the traveling salesman problem, which is uh, basically n factorial. And for the course set scheduling uh, one, it's uh, in this case a period times the room uh, to the power of the lectures, I think. Um, so that's the first one, get your domain model right. Uh, uh, so that's really a critical thing uh, in an OptiPlanner project. And we're always happy to help you uh, 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 with any questions you have there and also uh, 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 and to consult the experts when you have questions there. But as I said, the OptiPlanner manual has a very good guide on doing the domain modeling. Duncan, tell you. Yes. Uh, we have a question here that I think that you'll be able to address. So first of all, yes, everyone, I'll grab these slides from Duncan after he finishes and I'll share it with you. And second, uh, can you give like a list of vendors who would be able to help this person uh, implement his solution? He's like looking for OptiPlanner to be used for assigning order to multiple vendors, for example. Do you know someone that can help him maybe? Well, well, obviously we work for Red Hat, and the uh, the OptiPlanner project is a is a Red Hat sponsor sp sponsored project. So, if you want to get consulting from and help from from the people that have done this before at various customers, I can say for ourselves that we've done this before. And second is that. Uh, um, is that the OptiPlanner uh, developers and the project leads are uh, Red Hat employees, or most of them are Red Hat employees. So I can say for ourselves, we provide consulting services to uh, to help you uh, get your project started. Perfect. So, Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. You're welcome. Good. Uh, benchmarker. This is an interesting one. So a lot of people, uh, as with a lot of tech, you don't always read the manual, right? You get the, you can, uh, you get started and you download the the the, uh, the project and you start coding. You look at it, a bunch of examples and off you go. Um, the one thing that I that I always tell my customers that they have to do on day two of their OptiPlanet project, because day one is you get to meet your colleagues and, and you have a, a coffee, a good lunch, and you uh, you create the agenda, the team and your backlog and so forth and so forth. Uh, day two is uh, please, even be, maybe even before you start coding, uh, start creating your benchmark. So what's the benchmark? The benchmarker actually is a uh, a, a component within the OptiPlanet project that you can feed with uh, a solver configuration, so a configuration of your OptiPlanet um, uh, uh, library, your OptiPlanet solver. Uh, so OptiPlanet can run into in multiple different configurations. You can can run multiple different algorithms, different configurations of algorithms, termination strategies, uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, different dials that you can that you can uh, can can turn. Um, what the benchmarker does is you can feed it uh, one or more uh, OptiPlanet configurations, and you can feed it your uh, domain model, so you're the actual code of your project that defines what your planning entity, what your planning variable and uh, your data, so the, your data sets. So that could be a small data set, a medium data set, and a large data set. What the benchmarker does, it runs all these data sets against all these different solver configurations, and it will give you an output in an HTML report that shows you the performance of the solver for these different data sets with, with these different configurations. And I really, really, really advise everybody that's going to do an OptiPlanet project, start investing in the benchmark from day two, really do. Even if you have nothing else or you don't have a lot else or you're started with just 
analyzing an example or anything like that, invest time in making sure that you've got this thing set up. That is on your on your calendar. So this is what it looks like. So this is an example of a benchmark that shows, in this case, for a, a soft score calculation, what the score progression over time is for your uh, uh, your problem. So what you usually see in an OptiPlanner project is a graph that looks like this. It's a graph of diminishing returns. So you see a lot of optimization in the first uh, and improvement of the score of your solution in the first couple of minutes. Uh, and for larger problems, say, let's say the first 10, 15, uh, 30 minutes of, of calculation. But then you get into sort of this limit function where you reach a point of diminishing returns. This is what you want to see. The problem is that if you don't implement a benchmarker and you don't uh, get these kind of uh, uh, graphs and you, you're not aware of the, the, the score calculation and the improvement of your, your solver over time, you really can't tell if you are implementing the, your OptiPlanner project the way you want to implement it. For example, I have been at a customer where uh, I didn't see a graph like this. Uh, first of all, I asked them, do you run the benchmarker? So their question to me was, what's the benchmarker? Uh, so then you already know that you have to invest some time there because you're basically blind and you can't see what your project is actually doing. So what we saw there is that we saw a flatliner. So just a flat line, no limit function or nothing, flat line. So what that means is that OptiPlanner is not improving any scores whatsoever. So it's crunching and crunching and crunching and applying all these heuristic matter heuristic algorithms to your problem, but you're not improving the solution of your of your of your score. You're not the, you're not improving the score of your solution. So what that means, well, it can have multiple uh, uh, causes, but uh, usually that means that, as I said before, your solution space might be too large. You might have too many planning entities. You might plan want to plan for too uh, long of a period of time. So in this case, the use case was uh, planning. It was like a shift assignment planning for uh, the entire UK. So that's uh, uh, England, uh, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, uh, but for six months. So they wanted to plan in advance all these assignments for six months. And that created such a large problem for that entire country uh, that we just got a, 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 a flat liner uh, on, this, uh, on this graph. So the obvious solution then is, well, try to uh, create a smaller problem. Do you really need to plan six months in advance, advance or is one month enough? Do you really need to plan the entire country? Because you probably know that a person that lives in Northern Ireland will never be assigned to a shift somewhere in London. So there's a lot of tricks there and a lot of things that you can do to make sure that you're creating a solution space that is manageable by something like OptiPlanner. And the benchmarker is one way to find out if your solver is doing what it should be doing. Uh, other examples uh, that we teach in our course as well uh, is our RD. So the first one uh, is uh, basically a performance bottleneck. When you see a graph like this, it basically means that the score is constantly, constantly improving, which it really shouldn't. It, it really should, well, it should constantly improve, but it should show this line of diminishing returns. Here, you just know that you're not giving your OptiPlanner uh, 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 your OptiPlanner process enough resources, enough compute to actually improve the score. So it could be that your score calculation count is too slow and so forth, or that you have made a mistake somewhere in your application, what, which causes the calculation to be extremely slow, or you don't have enough compute. That could be the case as well. Um, the, the second one is interesting as well, where you see all these, these jumps. Uh, that usually means that it's, it gets stuck in a local Optima somewhere, and that by coincidence, it's able to jump out of that. So we've got solutions there as well to maybe start using different moves, more coarse grain custom moves to make sure you don't get stuck in these, these local optimas. Maybe use another algorithm as well. Um, and the last one, as I said, uh, that's sort of the law of diminishing returns. That that looks really nice. If I see a graph like that in an OptiPlanner project on the benchmarker, I'm usually quite happy. Um, uh, but there, you could also then try to use other benchmark uh, or benchmark other algorithms, power tweak the algorithms you're using, just to get that extra one two percent uh, uh, out of your solution. As 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 we have seen, an extra one two percent could easily be a million bucks. So it 
could be worthwhile to at least spend a couple, couple of minutes to try some different configuration settings there. Um, so the benchmarker, super important. Don't forget that, set it up from day two. First day, coffee and uh, meet your team. Second day, set up the benchmarker. Um, it also allows you to see which algorithm you should choose. So as I said, OptiPlanner comes with multiple algorithms, multiple uh, meta-heuristic algorithms to uh, uh, solve your problem. Like there is taboo search, simulated annealing, late acceptance, and so forth. And we often get the question, which algorithm should I use for my specific problem? And there's not a, a rule for that. There's not not, not a, a silver bullet. And, and uh, as my grandfather, who was in construction, always used to say, measuring is knowing. And that's the case with OptiPlanner as well. So also there, the benchmark is important. You can feed it with different data sets and different algorithms might, might react different to different data or might provide different output for different data sets uh, in terms of performance. So again, there, make sure you provide a data set that you're going to use in production or a data set that's like a data set that you're gonna use in production, use the benchmarker, different configurations, and pick the best algorithm for your specific problem. Score calculation types, that's another interesting one uh, and an, a common pitfall. Um, so basically, AutoPlanner provides a number of ways to define how you calculate a score. So what's a score? Uh, basically, what you need to have is that when OptiPlanner has found a solution to your problem, uh, it needs to be able to compare that uh, deterministically with another, with the score of another solution. So you define score functions or score rules uh, to define the score of that specific solution. So, for example, you can, uh, when you have a, a um, uh, a constraint that somebody can only drive maximum eight hours consecutively, and a solution has a driver that uh, has to drive eight and a half hours consecutively, then you can penalize that solution with a 30 minutes um, a negative soft constraint, as we call it. Now, we OptiPlanner provides different ways of implementing that, that score calculation. So the first one is what we call simple Java. Um, and simple Java, uh, basically, I'm not sure if we've got it on the next slide. Yeah, let's let's look at that. So simple Java uh, uh, is, is very easy to write. Um, it, it basically grabs your entire uh, solution and it calculates a score from scratch. So it, it grabs the whole solution, goes through all the planning entities and variables and starts to to uh, uh, calculate that score. It's very easy to write. Uh, it's just that it's extremely, extremely, extremely slow because it calculates everything from scratch. So do not use that for production. If you start writing your score rules in simple Java, we can guarantee you that you will not be satisfied with the outcome of the solutions that OptiPlanner gives you. And it's, and it's way uh, below what you can, uh, of the potential of, of OptiPlanner. Then we've got incremental Java. Um, incremental Java, and here's the thing, uh, the manual actually says uh, it's very hard to write. We do not recommend people to use this. However, um, we see a lot of customers actually thinking they're smarter than the OptiPlanner manual and think that it well, maybe it's not that hard. I'm a very, very good engineer. I can pull that off. Um, usually what happens is this, that they paint themselves in the corner. Um, it's very hard to write a incremental score calculation. So basically, to give you an example, what, what incremental score calculation does is OptiPlanner works by starting from a certain solution and then applying a change to that solution that we call a move, and then we then we reach another solution, and then we calculate the score for that next solution and compare it with the previous one to see which one is better. It's more sophisticated than that, but that's that's the the general concept of it. Um, what we do in incremental score calculation is that we don't co uh, calculate the score from scratch, but calculate delta between those two different solutions so we only have to calculate a little piece and be a lot faster in score calculation. So you can do that in Java with increment Java. However if you make a mistake in your uh, score calculation you get into something that we call score corruption and score corruption leads to a solution that's uh, uh, completely invalid. Duncan. The other problem is that it's uh, also very hard to maintain. It's very hard to implement individual score rules in uh, incremental Java. So also here the recommendation, like with simple Java, don't use it. 
I'm sorry, I would like to ask you just to repeat this last part because the internet, I think that the connection was a little bit shaky. So just this last uh, explanation would be fit. Okay. Okay, thank uh, you. Then the question is, was Karina's internet shaky or was my internet shaky? <laughs> I think it was yours. <laughs> I was checking yeah, it. You're sure? You're sure? Oh, that's weird. Uh, then my kids are probably watching Netflix in 4K or Disney Plus. You never know. Um, so, yeah, no, well, incremental Java, what it actually means is that, well, you write an incremental uh, score calculation, which says, well, I've got a solution here with a score. I move to another solution by applying a small change within that solution. And I only uh, calculate the delta of that, uh, of that score. So you don't have to calculate the entire problem from scratch or the, the score for the entire solution from scratch, you only calculate the delta. That's very hard to write. It's also very hard to maintain. So uh, the the um, uh, adding additional constraints or changing constraints is actually very, very hard. It's also error prone. So if you make a mistake there, you can get uh, score corruption. Score corruption leads to an invalid uh, solution. So your solution is basically useless. So again, not recommended. I've seen too many customers that use it and then ha they have to retrofit something else uh, uh, after two months of development. And that's, uh, 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 that's uh, not, never a good thing. Okay, luckily the internet is connection be is better. I'm on fiber here, so that shouldn't be the problem. So I blame some uh, some other component in the network. Um, so the other one score calculation types are DRL. So that's the rule, rule language. Um, that's incremental by default. That's how that engine works. Uh, so in the past, that this was always the, the, the go-to uh, uh, type of score calculation. We always advise to use DRL. The problem with DRL, the is that there is a learning curve. So if you don't know rules, if you don't know how to write declarative rules in a rules engine, uh, DRL does have a learning cur curve. Once you get it, once you're familiar with rules, it's relatively easy to write. But that's, I'm opinionated because I've been using rules for the last, I think, nine years. Uh, so once you're familiar with rules, actually adding constraints and removing constraints and changing constraints is relatively easy because they're all declarative de de defined in their own space. Um, as I said, it's fast. It has uh, implicit incremental calculation. Uh, what we tend to advise users nowadays and what users and especially Java developers seem to like more nowadays is the new Java streams like API, which is called constraint streams. Uh, Lukash uh, will tell uh, more about constraint streams in his talk. I'm not sure which day that is. Uh, um, tomorrow or the day after, not sure. You have to look at the agenda, but Lukash will talk uh, more in uh, detail and depth about uh, constraint streams. Um, it uses drills under the covers. Uh, it's a Java streams like API. It's relatively easy to write if you're familiar with the Java streams API and it's fast. Under the covers, it uses drills, so it uh, has implicit incremental calculation. So make sure from day one, you choose the right score calculation type. Um, Environment modes. This is a great one as well. This is what we do in consulting also in day one and we impress everybody and everybody's super happy that we came and gives us free beer and stuff. Um, so are there bugs in my code? Especially when uh, customers start writing their own uh, incremental Java calculation type. This is something that we switch on a lot. So there's uh, a number of assert mode or, or environment modes in OptiPlanner that not a lot of people know about because they don't read the manual, uh, but that we really recommend to switch on from time to time, say once a week or twice a week, just do a run with one of the assert modes on. Um, Basically what they do in, in general is that apart from the incremental calculation, they will also uh, do things like a full calculation of a new solution and, 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 and compare those two scores, which should be similar, they should be the same. So it's able to detect bugs in your code. It's able to detect bugs in your rules. It's able to detect bugs in your uh, score calculation and so forth. As I said before, score corruption is bad. Score corruption leads to uh, an investment balance uh, solution. So make sure that every now and then you set up this environment mode. You make sure that you run, at least run a fast assert, but if you can, it, it slows down the engine tremendously because it does all these extra calculations and starts comparing things with each other. But make sure that every now and then 
at least once a week, you run a faster cert or maybe even a full cert mode, just to make sure that your project is still in, in optimal condition, that you haven't don't have any bugs in your code and, and cor score corruption and so forth. Um, so this is how you do that. It's a bit of XML uh, uh, in the uh, the solver configuration. Set it to full assert, and you're uh, you're all done. Also important, keep the user in control. So this is what we've seen at customers as well, where there's usually this. Um, well, since every every customer already has a planning problem, the planning problems they already have, everybody has that vehicle routing problem, but usually it's up till now uh, implemented by uh, humans. They use Excel spreadsheets or maybe an application that was built somewhere years ago. Uh, but there is usually a team that is responsible for these uh, for this planning and and for these plans and these these rosters. Make sure you keep the user in control from day one. Make sure you involve that team and don't be the cocky IT guy that has got this new shiny toy called OptiPlanner and will show you how bad you have been doing this planning all these years and that can, I can do it much better than what you've been uh, doing for the last 10 years. Look at me and how good I am. Don't do that. That will fill your project from day one because what you need is you need buy-in from the business. You need to show these people, not that you're replacing them by a very smart shell script, you need to show these people that you're giving them a new cool tool, a new thing that can improve their work, that can help them do their job even better than they are already doing. And why do you need that? Why do you need to keep that user in control? It's very simple. You think as an IT guy, and every IT guy thinks this, you think that you know the problem that you're trying to solve. But let me tell you, there's domain experts that have been doing this for years that have a lot more domain knowledge, especially around really specific things uh, in that domain that you will never know because you don't, you haven't worked in that area uh, uh, for the last, you haven't seen all the changes. So usually you get a lot of information from the, these, do, these domain experts. What does the domain model look like? What is this kind of thing that's called a schedule? Or what is this kind of thing called a shift? How do you define that? What is an employee? What is a skill? Can you have both skills at the same time? If I have both skills at the same time, do I only need one person on that shift that requires both skills? Or do I still need two people uh, uh, because I need two people that have those skills filled? Those kind of things are super, super important when you start defining both your domain model and your constraints. So get them involved quickly from day one. Make them important. The second thing is setting planning priorities, right? So you might think, yeah, I, I want to optimize everything based on time or based on customer satisfaction or based on money or based on ecological footprint. But usually there are trade-offs within a planning problem. So make sure that you understand the trade-offs and that you let the business people stay in control and control the trade-offs and make sure that they control which trade-offs are made within the solution. And the other thing is visualize and publish. So don't start with creating this super shiny React.js web app that's running on your mobile devices and what have you to show all your nice planning things. Make sure that from day one, you can do that at a later stage, but from day one, make sure that you provide the output of your solutions in a format that the business can read. Why? Because they need, you need them on board to validate that the outcome of your solution is correct that there are no things that, that are, are wrong or that, that are basically wrong in your model or in your constraints. So usually what we say is Excel is actually often a very good choice to start with. Just output your planning solution in Excel and provide that to the business and ask them, is this valid? Is this, this, is this correct? Is this a good solution? Uh, is this, is this, can we implement this? So Another thing that we say to keep the user in control is, is allow them, we have got a feature called pinning planning entities, allow them to pin planning entities. What this means is that they can say, well, I want to uh, assign this process to this computer, or this shift has to be at that time and it has to be filled in by this employee and OptiPlanner can't touch it. We know that that will not reach the optimal solution, <clears throat> but you keep the user in control because there might be a valid reason why they want to do that. So keep the user in control and we provide features in OptiPlanner to do that. Uh, for example, pinning planning entities. The other things that we do is uh, the uh, constraint weights. So based on the score 
functions that you provide, we tend to give weights to certain constraints. So as I said before, if you have like a, 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 a driving time that goes be, uh, beyond something in the constraints, you can say, well, we do a minus 30 soft score. If you weigh those constraints, then you can have the, the stakeholder decide on what the platform should optimize on. For example, in this example, you can have a quality stakeholder that focuses on the load on a certain machine uh, versus the financial stakeholder that focuses completely on cost. So by having these constraint weights that we can implement using constraint configurations in the platform, uh, you can give the control over those weights to a user and they can make the decision uh, what's more important in this case, uh, uh, the cost or something else. And visualization, as I said, we have another uh, number of examples that do that in Excel. That's usually very useful. Uh, and when you go further in your project, we usually see that the, 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 the platform, the solutions get embedded in the more sophisticated tools with web UIs. We've seen sort of app store like concepts at, at, a, at an airliner at a, some point. That was an interesting idea of how to present those, uh, those solutions. There are multiple options, but make sure you visualize in a way that's understandable by your stakeholders. Explaining the score. Uh, sorry? Kind of interrupting as usual. Before as you move forward. forward. <laughs> I can interrupt you. You're good. So yeah, are these visualization tools like easy to use, Duncan? So the thing is, OptoPlanner doesn't provide any uh, visualization tools in the project uh, itself. But what we do is we're a Java-based API. So what we tend to do is that that we um, allow integration with any form of, of, of tool, uh, with any form of data format that we can uh, can uh, expose. So we, you can use JSONB, you can use Jackson or whatever you want, if you want to use uh, uh, JSON formats and so forth. You can implement this as a service. You can implement the UI that fetches this from a data store and so forth. So we don't have a very opinionated uh, say in what kind of UI uh, you have to use. What we do have, and I think Yuri will talk about this, is that we've got a number of sort of template projects that provide a UI of the, out of the box. For example, we have got one for vehicle routing, which is an important use case uh, for OptiPlanner, uh, in which we've seen um, a, a lot of customer success, actually, uh, a, a large customer of ours that is saving, I think, $220 million a year, uh, basically using a vehicle routing uh, solution uh, with OptiPlanner. We provide a, a template application for that, including a UI uh, out of the box with the, with the project. Uh, I think we the other one is for employees you rostering. So we do provide some UIs, uh, but if you want to implement your own, obviously um, uh, everything is available to uh, to integrate your own UI technology. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder, you have eight minutes at yeah, max. I, yeah, 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 at max, I'll, I'll speed up a bit. Uh, I'll optimize a bit. So I'm not going to go too much into explaining the score because uh, this will be covered in other sessions today. Uh, but basically what explaining the score means is that based on a certain a solution that OptiPlanner finds, uh, we can actually uh, infer uh, what kind of uh, constraints and what kind of uh, uh, rules led up to that specific score and which uh, planning entities and which objects were involved in getting that uh, uh, or creating that score. So you can see uh, uh, the, which um, parts of your solution are suboptimal and which actually uh, are, uh, are are causing that score to to be what it what it is. Uh, especially when you've got hard uh, score uh, violations, uh, be so, uh, they, that can usually be a good indication that you're missing certain resources. You don't have enough vehicles. You don't have enough, enough teachers with a certain skill. You don't have enough nurses with a certain skill. Or they're not available in the right time and so forth. So explaining the solution is extremely important, also for decision makers within the organization that want to know why you can't come up with a, a, a um, an optimal solution uh, or a feasible uh, solution in this case, if you break hard constraints. So visualization, again, explanation, uh, and we're gonna get more into trust the AI uh, and, 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 and explainability uh, in the next sessions is extremely important as well. Reproducibility. Uh, this is a bit more technical, uh, but reproducibility is key, uh, not only for your own sanity, uh, but uh, also when you want to contact support, when you want to uh, contact uh, the project leads, uh, the community and so forth. Uh, so basically every run that OptoPlanner does is, is reproducible. So it takes 
every single time it takes the same step. So if you apply the same data set to the same solver configuration, all the steps that it does um, is reproducible. So it will be the exact same every time. So this is interesting when you find a bug somewhere that we can reproduce the exact same thing uh, in, an own, in our own OptoPlanner one when we try to reproduce your uh, your problem. There are some caveats though. Uh, there's, there's some pitfalls. And, and usually the first ones, People don't really get in, tend to get involved with that one too much, but the second and the third one are important. We see a lot of people that write their domain model that use HashMap, and iteration uh, over HashMap is not uh, non-deterministic. It's not reproducible. So what we always say when you define your domain model, if you need to use HashMap, if you need to use HashSet, use the linked HashMap and the linked HashSet implementation because iterating over those uh, uh, implementations of HashMap and HashSet is deterministic and is reproducible. So, so that's that's really a, a key thing in the domain modeling part. Use linked HashMap, use linked HashSet, uh, um, and so forth. Um, yeah, so as I said, it's gold for debugging, support, demos, and obvious, obviously your and our uh, sanity uh, as well. Um, so that was basically it uh, and all I had. Uh, and those were some of the key pointers that we have for uh, for starting your the planner project. We'll make the slides available. Uh, we can chat later in the in the in the chat to have more discussion on certain topics if you want to have more information about that. Uh, some resources. Um, the OptiPlanner website, obviously OptiPlanner.org. Um, some of the slides that you've seen here, especially around the domain modeling one, uh, are in the learning slides. So you can uh, reference those. We'll make these available as well. But those slides put that uh, topic a bit more into uh, into context. Uh, the domain modeling guide is, is is very important and very interesting. And if you start an OptiPlanner project, I really, really recommend you to read that. And Geoffrey, uh, a while ago, uh, actually a couple of years ago already, uh, wrote a, a blog about seven ways to fill your optimization project, uh, which this talk was a bit inspired on. The the, the blog goes into, uh, I think, a more technical depth and, and addresses a number of more technical uh, pitfalls uh, rather than the organizational pitfalls that I've, uh, that I've uh, uh, shown you today. So that was sort of what I've had for today. Um, and I, I imagine that Karina would come in and ask another question or say thank you. What's it gonna be today, uh, Karina? Um, <laughs> just a big thank you. Like it, it was really useful tips. Actually, um, let me bring Geoffrey to stage before we get ready to the, to the next uh, talk. So I wonder, we have all sorts of people here from all over the world and we are talking about the second day like what do i do on the second day right so what if the person is just get start just getting started what do you recommend where do they go how do they get started like tips for these people uh, Dun duncan's presentation really outlined that very well the benchmarker is definitely the, si the, the secret weapon that um it's very much underused. Um, there's there's many. Uh, you go to the website, of course. You try out the quick starts. Um, looking into looking into the integration, we now have integration with Quarkus. We have integration with Spring, so uh, that can really save you a lot of time, um, and it can really reduce the amount of the amount of coding you have to do. Uh, so, for example, the solver config XML is now completely obsolete. So, um, if you don't like XML, you don't have to do it anymore. Lovely. Oh, I, I have got a question, question here. Wait, Karina, I... there's, now that we've got Joffrey here, uh, is it about the multi multi threading one? Yeah, I was looking at the same one. So feel Ooh. free to answer, uh, Mr. De Smet. Um, do you want a complete technical explanation or? No, you've got two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Jerry Locker is on the backstage. <laughs> short answer is yes. Um, there's, of course, a few caveats, uh, but the short answer is. If you use multi-threading, uh, one of the criteria we had is that it needs to be reproducible, um, which also impacted some of our architectural choices there. In fact, um, we've written a paper about it. And um, one of the big questions that some of the reviewers had, why don't you just sacrifice reproducibility and then you can maybe get some extra gain there um, uh, or make it simpler. 
And we've deliberately not done that because reproducibility is king. Uh, debugging um, or any control environments um, and just during development, if you can reproduce your bug or your issue or your behavior, or if you cannot, uh, it's it's the difference between you know success for a project sometimes. So yes. That was quick. Let me take here. So everyone's like really thankful, Duncan. Duncan, thank you. So uh, in the meanwhile, during the presentation, I also saw that they were uh, like Lukas was having a chat with Emmer like about the if statement. So uh, this is really good. Uh, feel free to keep on chatting on the on the chat. Uh, Unfortunately, we cannot be on the same place, but we are still together. So this is totally accept acceptable. And please go on. Let's get yep. more. Well, one more question for Duncan, if I may. Um, in all of the projects you've done, uh, what would you find the most interesting or more most special case you've ever done? Mm. Uh, without mentioning, you know, maybe you can. Yeah, yeah. Without without mentioning the actual customer name, uh, I th I think what I found found from Personally, the most interesting one, but it's because of personal interest and because of the team that was present on site was uh, the one that I did with you and Paolo in Hamburg uh, because it, uh, uh, it was around um, um, maintenance scheduling. Um, but the, the use case itself was, was very interesting. Uh, the, the customer was very enthusiastic about uh, their own project and what they were doing. Um, it was part of a, a larger solution uh, that they provided and, and were selling to their customers uh, uh, as well. So it was not just we want to optimize this thing, but it was a, a part of a, of a, a greater sort of say vision or application or system uh, to help all different parts of, of maintenance scheduling of, of their fleet. Uh, I found that extremely interesting because it touched basically upon a lot of things. A lot of things in this talk were inspired actually from that use case. I think you actually you, uh, could identify that, uh, but it was good that we had a customer that was, uh, first of all, their engineers were, were very intelligent and they were very into OptiPlanner. Uh, they also uh, um, really absorbed our our, um, our recommendations and were very quick in turning around and making changes. And we provided just a lot of technical details at the same time having you there. There was some stuff uh, where uh, we were just discussing things where I was just going like that in my chair and go like woof. Uh, but uh, at, at least the customer still understood everything and, and we were able to deliver really great value. So for me, that was the, the most interesting one. Pretty cool. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need to bring our next speaker to stage, Jiri Locker. Welcome, Jiri. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, welcome. So Jiri, are you going to tell us more about vehicle routing? Yes, sure. So um, I should uh, uh, should I start uh, sharing my screen with the slides? Yeah, and uh, I would appreciate if you if you told the people who are watching us a little bit about you and your background, so they get more familiar with you, Mr. Jerry Locker. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like that Brazilian air that you always have, Karina? It's awesome working with you. <laughs> I really have to say, big compliments to you. So, uh, Geoffrey, Duncan, let me show you the path to the backstage. And uh, Jerry, the stage is yours. Good presentation. I really look forward to this talk. So, hello, everyone. I'm Jerry Locker. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. And I joined uh, the OptoPlanner team uh, in 2018. And shortly after I joined the team, I started uh, working on um, on vehicle routing application. And this has been my main focus for the past uh, two years. So in this uh, talk, I'm going to uh, share the experience I uh, gained uh, on this project. And I will talk about, uh, I will start with the introduction of the vehicle routing problem, uh, why, it, why it is, uh, interesting and how uh, it's different from other use cases that OptaPlanner can handle. 
I will um, shortly talk about the solving methods that are that used uh, for vehicle routing problems. And then I will um, share some useful tips and technologies uh, that we used for building the OptaWeb vehicle routing application, which is uh, which already has been mentioned by Duncan. It is a template application that solves some interesting problem specific for the vehicle routing use case that are out of scope of uh, Opta Planner itself. Um, then I will uh, make a short, uh, I will do a short demo, live demo of vehicle routing, Opta Web vehicle routing. And um, at the, after the demo, I will close the, the talk, the presentation. So let me first introduce the vehicle routing problem. It is a common use case for uh, businesses that deal with some kind of transportation. It can be food delivery, package delivery, personal transportation, such as taxi services or technician scheduling, uh, scheduling where employees need to travel in order to perform some kind of service task. Uh, formally, it is a combinatorial optimization problem that seeks to service a number of customers with a fleet of vehicles. But this is just the basic form. In real life, each use case comes with a unique set of additional constraints. So in fact, VRP is a generic term covering a whole class of vehicle routing flavors, such as capacit capacitated uh, VRP, where the vehicle capacities are limited multiple de depot VRP, where the vehicle fleet is distributed over a number of depots. Then we have split de delivery VRP, where the same customer is allowed to be served by different vehicles. So the, the order can be split between different vehicles. And another very common um, extra constraint for the problem is time windows where the customer is only able to accept the delivery during a certain time window. And then we have another flavors like pickup and delivery and backhauls, etc. So what are the solution methods that are used uh, for vehicle routing problems? Basically, all methods fall into two categories which is the exact approach and heuristic approach. Well, the goal of uh, exact approach is to design algorithms that can find the optimal solution most efficiently. They are rarely useful in practical applications because due to the difficulty of the vehicle routing problem, it takes them unreasonably long to um, find a solution even for moderately sized problems. So they are, they are slow, that's their main characteristic. On the other hand, uh, heuristic approaches are designed to produce a solution quickly by trading optimality for speed. So while they only produce an approximation of the optimal solution, you get something that you can work with, that you can use to solve the problem at hand, and you get it in a reasonably short amount of time. And a subset of uh, the heuristic approach is called meta heuristics. And these are methods for controlling the basic heuristic algorithms with the goal of exploring the search space more efficiently. One of their main characteristics is that they are not problem specific. And I think this is the key um, reason why Opta Planner uh, took the meta heuristic uh, approach. And uh, it contains several implementations of meta heuristic algorithms out of the box. And this gives you a huge benefit because you can take almost any problem, not only vehicle routing, 
and start experimenting and tweaking uh, these algorithms without having to re-implement them. So your job or task as a Java, Java developer uh, trying to build an application uh, based on OptaPlanner is to learn, read the documentation, learn about uh, the algorithms uh, that are available and how to configure them. Then you have to model the uh, domain of your of the business that needs your solution in Java using OptaPlanner API. And the third step is to write the score function. So this is great because uh, thanks to this level of flexibility of OptaPlanner, uh, this gives you the freedom to build an application that solves any flavor of VRP that you come across in the real world. Now, uh, a bit about the scoring function. So now that we have an idea of the general approach to solving optimization problems with OptaPlanner, uh, let's take a look at some specifics of uh, vehicle routing. So this time we'll um, take a look at, uh, at the cost of traveling between, uh, between uh, the depot and customer and another customer. So when writing uh, the score function that uh, allows to compare the quality of different solutions discovered by the search algorithm, you want to penalize the solution score by a number representing the cost of each route traversed by a vehicle. It doesn't really matter whether you optimize for the shortest or fastest route. In both cases, you have to get a number based on the length and type of the road connection between the points of, of, on the route. An important thing to keep in mind when uh, thinking about uh, the travel cost and uh, scoring function is that for OctaPlanner to search uh, the solution space efficiently, it has to calculate the score quickly. So this means you should avoid any IO operations during uh, the score calculations, especially accessing files on the file system or calling services over the network. Uh, what what does this mean for vehicle routing? Uh, it means that um, you have to calculate the complete distance matrix for all locations that are part of the problem and keep that matrix in memory while OptaPlanner is running. And the first question is, how do we even get uh, this piece of in information? How do we get the travel time between any given two points on, on a map. So luckily, <clears throat> there is a project called OpenStreetMap, which contains uh, geographical data about the whole world. Data is contributed and maintained by the community and is open, which means that you can use it for any purpose as long as you credit OpenStreetMap and its contributors. So I can highly recommend uh, using this project uh, when building any kind of geo, uh, geographical, uh, geographical information system or the type of application. Uh, next uh, piece uh, we need to complete the puzzle is a way to extract the exact type of information that we need from OpenStreetMap map, map data. Specifically, we need to find road connections between points of interest and the time it takes to traverse such connections using a selected type of vehicle. Again, thanks to the amazing <coughs> open source world, this isn't something we need to do ourselves. There is a project called Graphopper that can be fed with um, with the OpenStreetMap data. And uh, it has a nice API that uh, finds routes between points together with details such as the travel time and the exact uh, route geometry, which is useful for visualization 
and even directions, which is useful for uh, navigation applications. This is another <coughs> reason we went for GraphHopper when building Opta Web Vehicle Routing, because although there are commercial services providing the distance matrix API, uh, this type of request for uh, provided by these uh, commercial services is usually limited to about 50 locations. While with Web vehicle routing, we aim for larger problems that can solve even thousands of uh, customers. Uh, another interesting topic is uh, visualization of the uh, of the problem and of the solution. And so, because uh, geographical services are very popular on, on the web, it is no surprise that we can find many technologies for web visualization in the open source world. We uh, use Leaflet for Opta Web Vehicle Routing because it's uh, lightweight, it has a nice API, and is very flexible and allows you to consume raster map tiles from any vendor, not only OpenStreetMap. Uh, and you will see it just in a while. So <clears throat> let's now take a quick break and spice up the presentation with a live demo. I'll, I hope it will go without breakage. So let me start the application. Uh, I like to use Belgium for demos because it's a relatively uh, small and compact region with a dense road network. So let's, let's add a few Belgian cities. I'm going to first uh, use a feature called geocoding, which is a common feature of geographical applications. And it simply means that uh, I can type in the name or the address of the place I'm looking for. And the application will send me a list of matching coordinates that I can display on the map and decide whether it is really the place I was looking for. I will del deliberately look for places that coincidentally are valid English words so that I don't mess up the Dutch or French pronunciation. I have prepared a list of these locations. So for example, Billy is someplace at Belgium. We also have Silly, interesting. And places like Philly, Willy, Nelly. Oh, this one doesn't work. So let's uh, try something else, Ham. loop and boom. Nice. So we have we have a couple of locations. Uh, yeah, and another interesting um, part of this uh, geocoding feature is that I can even uh, include some um, basic restrictions in the query. So I can, uh, for example, search for gas station in Antwerp. And I get some relevant results. So now we have a few locations, a depot and a few customers on the map but there is no route and this is because uh, we don't uh, have any vehicles in the in the depot so let's add one and you may have noticed that uh, i immediately received a solution and you may also have noticed that the solution that i received first has uh, immediately improved without me having to refresh the browser or anything like that. So, and even if I add new uh, customers, 
the, the solution will uh, update immediately. So this is a feature, an important feature in OptaPlanner that is called real-time planning and means that I can provide new information about the problem while solver is running and it will take that into account and adjust uh, the, the best solution according to that. So in this demo, uh, the default uh, capacity of, of a vehicle is 10 and the demand of a customer is one, one package. And you can notice that uh, even though I have one vehicle of capacity 10, it visits all, all the customers and nothing happens. So actually the vehicle, the solution is now breaking um, hard constraint, but since um, in this um, application template, we are focusing on specific problems to vehicle routing. There are some uh, advanced uh, OptaPlan features such as score explanation that are not yet implemented and are maybe waiting for a contribution from the com community. So if you're interested in, interested in this project and want to contribute, uh, find us on, on GitHub and submit issues or pull requests. So that's it uh, for the uh, for the demo. I will switch back to back to the slides. Uh, Chiri, is this demo? Oh yeah, uh, there it is. I was actually going to ask for the GitHub uh, link. That is mm -hmm. great. Thank you. So this is the summary of the of the presentation. We have seen uh, and learned that vehicle routing problem is very difficult and um, there is basically uh, no exact algorithm that is uh, usable for real world applications therefore we need to uh, resort to meta heuristics which give approximate solutions but uh, the, the, uh, are fast i have mentioned that opta planner has uh, several implementations of those meta heuristics uh, implemented and available out of the box. And one of the more most important takeaways of this uh, presentation is that for the score cal calculation to be, uh, to be fast and for the search algorithm to perform optimally, uh, you should avoid any IO operations. So, for example, the distance matrix that affects uh, the score needs to be in memory. I have shown several uh, geographical tools that we used for up the fake routing, like OpenStreetMap data, which is the source of geographical data, GraphHopper, which can extract uh, routing information from the data, and Leaflet uh, that can visualize geographical data on a map. And um, I made a demo of the Opta Web Vehicle Routing, which is an open source project available on, on GitHub. And um, you can learn about it on optaplanner.org. And if you want to try it, clone the repository from, from GitHub and build it and run it with Java. That's it, thank you. And now there is a room for questions. Thank you, Jerry. It was a great presentation. And every time that I see this demo and I see like, let me take your screen. Okay. okay. So every time I see the de this demo and when you immediately click in the right, the, the routing, just like the route just shows up on the screen. I'm like, oh my God, this is so perfect. It even looks like it's like fake because it's so quick. It's like, anyway, <laughs> I really love this demo. Uh, hey, Joffrey, Duncan, what do you think? Was it a, like, did you like the presentation? I can talk when I press the unmute button. Uh, yes, yes, I've seen this one before and Yuri and myself have worked uh, quite extensively on uh, on multiple iterations of this uh, of this demo. So it's great to see it, uh, it, uh, it move uh, beyond what we already did last year. So yeah, awesome. 
I can also recommend everybody take a look at the code. Uh, Jiri's code is uh, the quality of that is is extremely high. Um, the Sonar Cloud and so forth. He's the only one who gets the hundred percent level with with a non you know a non trivial project here. This is see well, that's why it's better. You removed all my code. That's 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 awesome. <laughs> So let me ask something, Jiri. At the beginning of your talk, uh, someone asked, like, how can I get in touch with Jiri Locker? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> like, are you in the lip? The key question, you? but uh, probably the easiest way that comes to mind is maybe through GitHub. I already received some um, issues from, uh, from community users that asked for a feature, reported a bug. So, this is probably the safest way uh, yeah, we, to get in touch with me. We, we always recommend people to come to the key chat or to the Optopanner dev, uh, dev list because um, you know the, if people go on PTO and so forth. And in general, we want to make sure if we answer a question in the community, we answer it for everybody in the community so everybody can benefit, not just nice. private conversations. So guys, I don't want to take much of the next speaker slot so you, you can stay in here i'll take you out in a while so we will next we will now uh, receive christopher Cianelli, and he will talk about how to visualize indictments and uh, after this we are gonna going to have a trusty ai meeting of the planner so this is going to be exciting huh both yeah. are going to be super exciting I've seen. I've never seen these. I know these guys. They're awesome, and I've never seen them actually present on an OptoPlanner specific uh, topic. So I'm. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Looking forward to that one. Yeah, I've heard they're going to combine. Um, they're they're working on combining predictions and taking those predictions and you and optimizing on top of those predictions. That's, That's almost ridiculous. inception. That's like AI in AI. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it's it's <laughs> a very interesting concept. It's it's uh, not just a concept. It's an idea that that's been. We've, we've done this more or less a little bit, but they're really taking it to the next level. And it's it's um, it's an amazing cross-pollination, I think, of, of projects. Uh, really oh, cross-pollination. Wow. Yeah. Learning new words. <laughs> right? So, Christopher, uh, welcome to stage. Could you please share your Hello. screen? Hi, May. Uh, Jiri, thank you so much for your presentation. Please stay around with our attendees on YouTube chat. Uh, feel free to chat with them. Geoffrey, Duncan, Jiri, follow me. Christopher, the stage is yours. OK, thank you, Katina. Did I pronounce your name right? Uh, anyways, hello, everyone. I am Christopher Tenari. I am a software engineer for OptiPanel. The main project I work on is OptiWeb Deploy Routering, which is a web application that allows you to plan your employees' set goals. And today I am going to talk to you guys about visualizing indictments. So how to create an explanation of your other truths and OptiPanel gives you and feign it to your user. So we will begin with what is score visualization? Then we will talk about indictments and constraint matches, what they are and how to get them. Then we will talk about some tips about visualizing the score. And then we're going to talk about how to identify deficient resources using indictments. And finally, how you can actually identify misbehaving constraints, some the from the visualizations. Finally, we will, we will just sum it up and have Q and A at the end. So, what is school visualization? So, you have created a solution for your fitness problem, and but when you show it to the user, you have the following questions. So why isn't Amy working on Monday, for example? Or maybe you're asked, is it possible to hire additional workers? Or maybe what will happen if Bob worked five days in a row? If you're given only the truth, it's hard to answer these questions because they require insight 
to help the problem interact with the constraints. So we do know if the children the octopad is bound in irrigated time, but we want to know why octopad think the children is good. And to do that is score visualization. So score visualization refers to a variety of techniques we need to visualize the score impact of penny entities. Group cases include being able to quickly tell what constraints a particular entity satisfies. So for instance, you get to learn that a SIF, because it is assigned to Amy, you have to satisfy her desires to work on that day, or maybe she doesn't want to work on that day. You can also visualize improvements that can be gained by just no resources. So they will be useful for business decisions, such as purchasing an additional vehicle or hiring another worker. And finally, you can use it to tag for misbehaving constraints. For instance, you may be double counting a constraint, calling it to be very double its constraint rate. So, just to give you a quick example, in this gallery below, order any employees working in multiple sets at the same time. It may be hard to see right now because there is no visualization whatsoever. But if I were to highlight any sets that break that constraint, the question become easier to answer. So, how do we get the information from Opera Plan? So, as you all should know, every tuition has a score. If you do incremental score calculation, so jewels or constraint stream, the score is the sum of all constraint matches. So, what is a constraint match? So, whenever a constraint is matched, so in this instance, no overlapping sets, a constraint match, the crime the constraint match is created. So over here, we have a constraint match. If for the constraint, no overlapping set, the top communication list is SIP1 and SIP2, because these two entities caught this constraint match to happen. A total impact to the score is minus one hard. Entities and problem facts can be in multiple constraint matches. So over here, SIF2 overlaps with both SIF1 and SIF3. So it would be involved in both constraint match 1 and constraint match 2. Over here, we see SIF1 and SIF2 in the certification widths. And over here, we see SIF2 and SIF3 in the justification widths. And then we also have a constraint match total with counts how many constraint matches there are for a particular constraint. So constraint match one and constraint match two go into the constraint match total for no overlapping sets. And we see its score is the sum of its two constraint matches or by its two hard. And then we ought to have the other side. So instead of counting it from the constraint, we can also count it from the penny entities or problem facts. So over here, we can see that we have an indictment for SIF1, and SIF1 is only involved with constraint match one, and total impact to the score is minus one hard. SIF2 and SIF3 also have indictments, and for SIF2, it will include both constraint match one and constraint match two, and the score will be minus two hard. So, in order to summarize the relationship, every constraint has a one-to-one -one relation with a constraint match total, where it can have many different constraint matches. And indictments have pretty much still too many relations with constraint match, and they may or may not have a justification where it will be an entity or problem fact. And each constraint match has a justification risk, but it will also be an entity or problem fact. So, how do we actually get the information to the panel? If you're using the theme boost order or you're using 
the cockets. Then you can inject score manager. We have a thin score routing method. If you're not doing that, you can altogether turn the score to active factory. The two important methods are get constraint match total map, which maps constraints to the constraint match total, and get indictment map, which maps planning entities to their constraint matches. So why do you use a two? You can use constraint match totals when you want a summary of your constraint matches. So maybe you want to answer the question, how many PTO requests we were able to satisfy? In that case, we will do explain score of our roster. Then we are going to get a constraint match total map. And now we are looking particularly for the constraints day off requests. And we are going to get the count uh, the, uh, how many times that constraint got satisfied. And that would be how many PTO requests we were able to satisfy. Well, maybe your question is a little bit more complicated and is about the score. In this case, maybe we have a few call constraints and we decide to make it one stop score equal one dollar spent on full. In that case, In that case, then you can obtain the score of the root. But then we get the constraint match total map and get full cost. And but now instead of getting the count, we simply get the score. Then After we get the score, we get the total food cost, and that would just be the soft score. You should read indictments when you want information about a particular entity. <clears throat> so, for instance, maybe you want to know how does the current assignment of the morning shift impact the score. In that case, you simply change the score again, but instead of getting the constraint total map, you get the indictment map. Then you get the morning shift. And then you simply get the score, we will tell you how much this shift impacts the score. Or maybe you want to join. Maybe you want to find out who wants to join Office Panel Mini or cannot attend due to a conflict. They are a little bit more complicated, so we actually need to do a variety of things. First thing, we get the indictment for the Office Panel meeting. Then we get the constraint map set for the indictment, so we get to see everywhere where it is violated. And then we are going to filter it in order to get the constraint that a desired attendee cannot attend. And then we are actually going to work at a justification risk. So in this case, all constraint will write config factory dot run talk dot join attendee. And the constraint streams that we could we'll talk about tomorrow. But they pretty much allow us to get what actually caused this constraint match to fire. In this case, we want the attendee, so we are going to get that. Then we are going to crack it into a list. So I'm now going to give you some tips about actually visualizing the score. So you have to be very uh, information overload. So you want to make things that important that are important to users stand out. Because you will get a lot of information, some of the constraint matches and the indictments, but not all of them have the same importance to the user. So one thing they should be aware of is you definitely want to make it easy to see the difference between short constraints and hard constraints. We want the hard constraints to stand out to the user because they represent things that make the schedule or your problem infeasible. 
So how do we do that? I can tap use a different color for hard constraints. Do that want to make sure it pops and stand out. And something else you can do is you can add icons in order to make it easier to see what hard constraints in particular are broken. You can also include a summary of constraints broken on top. But you do not want to go too overboard because that can actually make it too cluttered and hard to tell important information. So in general, you should hide details that are not important to the user. And if you want to show the details, you should show them when the user inspects an object. So instead of summarizing all your constraints, you show the top three that have the most impact and hide the rest maybe in a dialogue. And instead of showing all the constraints when an entity breaks, you show the top two and show a detailed dialogue when the user interacts with the entity. So what can we do else with Google Visualization? The one thing we can do actually is identify deficient resources. So how we do this is using virtual resources. We represent a missing or lacking resources or simply a resource we don't have. Where a virtual resource is used, you penalize the score by how much it would cost to acquire that resource. So it would refer to for determining if there any benefit to having a detonal pulley or buying detonal vehicles. So in order to do this, you actually need to modify your domain. So over here, I have my employee class, but now I actually add two detonal fields, cost, and it virtual. Then I actually need to create a constraint for it. So here a quick preview of constraint streams. So over here I say get pretty much everything from the, the employee class. And I want to filter to include only virtual employee. I want to say if there exists a zip assignment to that employee, then I want to penalize it to hot for the constraint higher additional employee by one medium by employee cost. And now when you are actually using it, first you need to get your original problem. Then you are going to add your virtual employees to the problem. In this case, I'm adding a new nurse and a new doctor. They have different costs associated with them. And then I am going to set my employee risk to my new employee rest. And then you can just solve the problem as normal. So one thing to note is the score level for the virtual resources constraint is crucial. If it is above all soft constraints, virtual resources won't be used if it is possible to solve without them. If we want to consider solutions that include virtual resources, even if it is possible to solve without them, put the virtual resource constraint on the soft score level. If you use virtual resources, remit the amount you add. E virtual resource added throws down the solver. So pretty much you don't want to add thousands if you're not going to need thousands. So add a couple more, depending on how many you think you may need. And finally, you can use core visualization to identify misbehaving constraints. So typically, constraint verifier is used to create unit tests for your constraints. But that only tests the correctness of your implementation, not that you implemented the constraint of the user actually wanted. So you may be wondering, how can this go wrong? Well, if for instance, it were to give you the following description of a constraint, two employees that do not like each other cannot work the same shift, it could be implemented as two shifts are the same if they sell the same time chart. So over here, we are that joining shifts at the same time chart, and then we are filtering it to where the employees that write sets 
contain one other. Or we could be implemented where two sets are the same, and they sell the same spot and time short. So over here, we add that there's no condition that the two sets must be in the same spot. And it may it be, what do I mean to be the same set? Do you mean two sets sell the same time short, or that two sets sell the same time short short, and the same spot? So pretty much key takeaway here is you must have constant communication between the business user and yourself that to keep getting updates and making sure that can train you implementing or what they actually wanted. So in a summary, you can use score manager to obtain score, get constraint match totals, and indictments you can use to obtain the score. When you're showing the affirmation in the UI, I outline important details and highlight more important ones. Use virtual resources to help identify deficient resources. And finally, you can use core visualization to help verify the constraint you implemented and what the user actually wanted. So thanks for watching my talk, and now we'll actually go to questions. Thank you. <laughs> oh, let me remove that. Let me remove that. Now I know that you're uh, the right way to say your name is Kianelli. So thanks, Christopher Kianelli, for being here. <laughs> well, I would just say Tinelli. <laughs> To it's the point okay. that it really will to find someone to pronounce my last name properly. Thank really? you for the presentation. Yeah. Good talk. I, I really think that this is also one of the gems that a lot of people underestimate in, 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 in Optoplar and the indictments and the amount of information you can get out of that. Um, mm -hmm. oh, that'd yeah. be more time than me. I would talk to Will Bean and actually time that. I can actually do a short demo if people want to see that. Oh, yeah, but uh, uh, optimal and three rostering. We still have some time, right, Karina? Yes. Bus, right? Okay. Yes, I can do optimal and three rostering, but I actually implemented a quick little demo in Caucus that it's all how simple it is to use indictments without any extra code. So, should I share my screen again? Uh, you can use something like five to seven minutes, and then we will be on the backstage here watching the demo, okay? Okay. Are there any questions or no? Not yet. If there are any, I will make sure that I bring it to you, okay? Okay. okay. So where is your screen again? <laughs> So I actually just want to quickly start it up. One thing, you will need to increase the font, the font size in your terminal. OK? OK. Well, you. you're not going to be looking at my terminal. OK, then. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a quick application I created to showcase score visualization. So here is an example of virtual values. So over here, you notice I actually have a doctor that is unassigned. Now you may think, okay, in that case we should hire and it's no doctor. But that actually not what we need. We actually need and it's no nurse. Because you notice, why are all doctors that is both a doctor and a nurse, they're currently working in this set. So when I actually hit solve, you know that this doctor get assigned to that doctor, that, and now we have a new virtual nurse. And over here, you know, it's, we can actually see the impact. So over here, we look at virtual nurse, we can see it affecting the score by my 10 salt. That's nice, it's very nice. And then you can also have a lot of data over here. So if you have to see this, it becomes hard to identify what sets are calling issue. But I know that because I highlighted it in red, you can immediately see this set is causing a problem, namely with this set, because they overlap at the same employee. And then when you solve it, that quickly get removed. 
And when you, now I may be wondering what could actually done for this. Well, there pretty much how I actually get the code. So I first some score explanation. I simply get the indictment map for it. And for each employee in SIF, I put a new water indictment in there. Water indictment is simply the indictment but for a SIF or an employee. So it's that easier to get it that way. And then I ought to get a summary over here. Then for everything in the indictment map, I can say if the key is SIF, then put it into the SIF indictment map. And if the key is employee, I put it into the employee indictment map. And then to use it in JavaScript, payments is actually simple. So over here, I simply also pass the score attribution and tip indictment map for the SIF.ID. And then over here, I actually do some basic coloring based on the score. So over here is the hot score less than zero that I create market broken. And if the medium score less than zero, that market unassigned. And yeah. Ugh, not that. That quick demo. And you can actually do more than stuff. So let me see how long it actually takes me to. Thanks for the demo. It was really interesting. So you're basically taking the indictments from the um, uh, from the API from OptoPlanner, and um, you're basically asking, here's an employee. So give me, uh, you know, which or give, give me based on the shift, which shifts are problems and give me the indictments back and you color those in the AUI. It's a really nice way to show where the bottlenecks in the plan are and um, which kind of employees as you just shown are. are mm -hmm. you know, really, thank you for, for sharing. That. Yeah. And are you wondering how far you can go with this? We can still see my screen, I'm guessing. Yes. One, two, and you can eventually create something like this, where you actually have a summary. So over here, I have sign every SIF. So I had 660 SIFs I need to assign. So now I'm going to start scheduling it. And you can actually clearly see what indictments happen. So over here, we can see, okay, the employee not the rotation employee. And we can actually see a summary up here about what are the main issues. Yeah. So instead of having a score of minus 125,000 soft, you can actually tell them, look, here's where you're losing soft points in those orange areas over there, right? You can really yeah. show what the bottlenecks are. So that's why it's a really very interesting feature when you once you take up the planner to the next level. Okay. Well, they're soft scaling my stream. Thank you. This was great presentation and demo. Actually, uh, this demo is also available at the the key YouTube channel, and uh, you can find an example by uh, assigning people taking into consideration the COVID status. So that's even like impressive. Okay, let me just see something here on the backstage. We already have our next speakers here. So uh, thank you, Christopher, for your presentation. People like it a lot. It was really informative. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Chris. Really nice presentation. Good content. Duncan, I'll bring you to stage in three, two, one. Come over here, Duncan Doyle. Wow, Welcome. Back. Welcome back. Hey guys. <laughs> so, uh, guys, we already had three great presentations from Duncan Doyle, Jerry Locker, and Christopher Chianelli. And we are about to have the next presentation from Daniele Zonka, Tommaso Teofili, and Rui Vieira. Rui Vieira in Portuguese. So 
Uh, this is going to be pretty exciting, right, guys? Are you enjoying so far the event? If you are there at home and enjoying, just send like send an emoji on the chat, say you hi, say where you are from, what time is it over there? Are you using Opto Planner? Just give a sign of life. I need some warmth, um, warm here, so please interact. Maybe your sweet here and there. Hashtag <laughs> Opto Planner Week. Hashtag Opto Planner Week. Yes. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's been it's been great so far. I, so we see a lot of content. I think I think what's really really interesting is that we're not showing the the five minute demos, but we're really showing some uh, some of the tools and capabilities that that are are not maybe the thing that you immediately see when you download Opto Planner, but are, are really really invaluable when you want to use it to actually uh, uh, implement a project and and solve real uh, real life problems and skills. So uh, yeah, very so happy so far and. Uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, to our next presentation. And uh, well, I've known Daniela for for quite some time now, and we've been, we've traveled together, we've done presentations together, we've done uh, uh, trainings together. So uh, I know he's extremely capable in presenting. That was uh, and and uh, content wise, uh, yeah, a strong background in uh, in financial services as well and AI. So. Um, I always like to see that when when engineers present and they have uh, uh, other backgrounds as well than than just uh, the software engineering part. It brings really that enterprise feel to uh, to a talk and to the products and to the content. So uh, yeah. yeah, I'm really excited about that one. Also because the other ones I knew what to expect, right? Especially my own talk, I sort of knew what to expect. Uh, this one I've got no idea. So uh, this is going to be a, a new one for me as well, probably for you, uh, Jeffrey, as well. Like for the first time ever, I for guess. The first time ever. You, you saw it here first. Exactly. Yeah. But it's, it is really excited, right? It's about taking pr uh, prediction data and using that directly into the uh, top planner model, but really combining these on, on well, I don't really understand all of it yet. Um, I'm watching and looking forward to this talk, but just, just just the potential there is great because um, there's this example where you say, okay, um, what, we need to have predictions. We need to know, for example, if we're selling sweaters, that uh, how many red sweaters do we need in our store in, I don't know, um, somewhere, uh, some in some location, right? And um, if you need, uh, based on how many sales there will be, based on last year's sales, uh, on other situations, you might say, okay, I need more or less sweaters. And the next step becomes, okay, making sure that those sweaters arrive there, which, which is a vehicle routing problem. And this is, uh, this is really interesting where you take prediction and you then feed them into optimization to actually optimize on top of that prediction. And one of the big interesting things of OptoPlanner is that our score model is pretty much um, oblivion into uh, where it comes from. So uh, yes, with constraint stream, for example, if you look in constraint streams, um, every constraint that matches uh, comes from, uh, actually ends up as a penalty, usually an int or a long, but there's nothing in our architecture preventing making that a distribution function or making that, you know, um, a much more complex object than just an int or a long for a single constraint. Um, there's also nothing preventing in our architecture saying from before that to actually feed into that. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, it's oh, all... Man. I now get the ideas about fuzzy scoring and stuff. Yes, drool's chance. Oh, it's wow. Well, well, imagine that you can say with logic, say, um, with Bayes logic, you can say, okay, um, I have a probability function of A and a probability, a probability function of that it rains. Uh, and then based upon that, I want to put that in my vehicle routing problem because if, if it rains, I want to avoid certain uh, locations and so forth, right? Uh, or I want to do this in the afternoon. Uh, for example, right? Um, if I'm, I'm uh, doing delivery of cement, for example, you want to do that outside of the rain element uh, moments, right? And, uh, location, so. Anyway, um, we are almost at the top of the hour. I will already bring our speakers to stage just so you get used to their faces, okay? So I'll bring Daniele Zonka. I'll bring Rui Vieira. Opa, I listened to some echo. And I'll bring Tommaso Teofili. Welcome to stage. But before we start chatting with your speakers, I'd like you to comment on this Daniel uh, request. So can you comment on if you often see over constraint planning problems in the wild? Um, 
From my side, I would definitely say yes. It's it's a very common constraint. Uh, go to any hospital, you have an over-constrained planning problem, um, even in normal times, let alone this year, right? Um, there's always too few nurses. There's all they would not love to put one more nurse on every shift, or and so forth, right? So, um, in fact, they have actually, if if you go to a hospital, they have things like interim nurses, which you can, uh, or freelance nurses, which basically specialize in filling up those gaps. Uh, that because uh, the hospitals cannot staff their departments with their normal nurses. Uh, do you guys see any of those kinds of over constraint planning problems? Yeah, yeah, we 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 see. Well, the, what's what's nice is that it sounds like a, a really sort of corner case difficult thing to do. Uh, where, as you say, it's actually quite common, uh, uh, and and also it's it's quite easy to implement in in OptiPlanner as well. It's not like that. that it's like special science <laughs> required, but mm -hmm. but just adding things like a medium constraint weight and 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 over constraint rules and stuff uh, brings you to well, well uh, obviously a, a feasible solution, which is what you're after. Infeasible solutions have no value. A feasible solution, what you're after. It also was interesting at the same time. We're talking about uh, indictment maps and all that kind of stuff. It it provides you with the 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 information of uh, what from a resources perspective you're actually missing in your organization and where your organization actually uh, might improve from a, from a uh, yeah what I say a resource perspective. And I can see I, I can think of some use cases. For example, now with the COVID situation with the pandemic, uh, we have this personal personal training studios where people could not attend to the classes, but they remained paying for it. So they now have a bunch of classes to take and they need to assign the, the personal trainer to the people who need to make their, those classes in those lots on the agenda. So it's it's kind of crazy to too much people to, to just take their classes again. And yeah, like there are common use cases in our daily lives and the hardcore use cases like in hospital with all this situation. Well, so I can see it everywhere. That's that's the thing right now. It's interesting that you say that, and and we've seen that uh, with rules and processes as well. But due to the situation that we're in, uh, this kind of technology all of a sudden becomes even uh, a lot more interesting. Where usually uh, a lot of the plannings would would go on just because uh, they people are used to plan that way, and 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 they they know the routine and they know what to deal with uh, uh, traditionally on a traditional basis. Maybe not finding the optimal or the best solution. But 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 getting along anyway. Nowadays, you, you see that disruption, especially what you pointed out with, for example, these classes that need to be rescheduled in in ways with constraints that we've never seen before. So now technologies like OptiPlanner even start providing more value because they can do that in a much better way, uh, uh, giving you the ability to add those special constraints, like with the COVID employee rostering constraints, uh, very quickly and coming to new results uh, uh, and and implementable results very rapidly so that's a very good example actually so my friends let me let's let's bring the speakers on board so uh tomaso rui and daniele welcome and thank you for joining us on the opto planner week event and for bringing this valuable content about trusty ai so i'd like to have you speaking just a little bit about your background so that people get to know you better. I will start from Tommaso on that side, and then we can go like this until Danny Boy. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Karina. So I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat and I'm working in the business process automation team, and in particular, focus on a Trust AI initiative. Uh, my background is uh, mainly on machine learning, natural language processing, and explainability. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> that's uh, uh, as quick as possible. So my, my introduction. So I'll hand over to the others. What about you, Rui? Tell us about you a little okay. bit. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Rui, and I'm a software engineer at, at Red Hat. And, uh, I have a background in statistics and and in computer science, and uh, I've worked previously in distributed applications. Uh, I worked in uh, Apache Spark, running on on OpenShift, 
and uh, in machine learning as well, and developing intelligent applications for OpenShift. And recently, I've, I've been focusing on, on business automation and in technologies related to this automation, and also in these uh, projects that try to bridge machine learning with business automation and, and uh, with, with uh, similar technologies. Yeah. And you, Mr. Daniel Sonka. Hi, Karina. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, for having us today presenting uh, this uh, this use case. Uh, my name is Daniele. I'm a principal software engineer as part of a business automation team. Uh, I'm focusing mainly on the decision manager, so the rules and trust CI in initiative. Uh, before that, I had some experience in one of the top European bank for in the big data engineering team. And uh, now we are here to, to try to use uh, Opta Planner on top of a prediction as uh, Geoffrey mm. correctly explained it. <laughs> Sounds cool. Would you mind sharing your screen? I don't want to take too much of your time. And I know Duncan here can't, can't hold his inner self like to just talk to his friends, but we'll have to, to hold it back, Duncan. We don't have so much time today. Let's go to the backstage. The stage is yours and a good presentation for you guys. Thank you. So, okay, so uh, we already presented ourselves. So let's start directly with the presentation. Uh, we are all part of business automation team and specifically Trust AI. So we want today to show how we can uh, use optimization also on top of prediction to provide the new information. In this case, we want to explain the prediction. We want to try to give a better understanding about a decision, why a decision, so a prediction in this case has been made. And we want to provide, for example, an example so that uh, people can uh, easily understand, or at least it could be easier for, the, for people to understand what's going on. So let's start first, uh, quickly introduce what business automation traditionally is. So we have multiple projects behind the scene that provide all the tools that we need to have uh, a proper business automation solution. So we have uh, rules for decision automation. Decision automation, for example, decision table. I have all my uh, characteristics and based on the, the value I see, I wanted to automatize my decision. So I want to decide uh, if process or not decision auto, um, car transaction automatically. Processes, I have my case, I have my loan approval, I have a uh, credit card approval. I have, I have, we are full of tons of uh, processes that need to be automatized because otherwise you cannot really scale. And definitely, of course, Opta Planner and the mathematical optimization is part of the story. Because, uh, for example, you have an e-commerce and then you need to optimize uh, the packaging and the shipping. But actually, constraint problem are really, uh, I mean, a constraint solver is uh, definitely flexible enough to apply to a lot of different use cases. On top of that, we also have Cogito. Uh, considering the technology that we mentioned before uh, has been created, let's say, five to ten years ago, uh, application development at that point was quite different. We, uh, we had mainly uh, monolithic application, so big, uh, let's say, application server with uh, a lot of different uh, decision processes and, in general, knowledge that need to be executed. Now, in a microservices and, in general, in a service approach, uh, we have a, a completely different setup. We have uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, of course, as a container orchestrator, but we have a Quarkus, we have Spring Boot. So that the setup is completely changed. And that's why we created Cogito as a next-gen next gen cloud native business automation solution that try to bring the same knowledge, the same uh, algorithm, and the same technology in a cloud native environment uh, that fit better with the current, uh, uh, the current need. In a picture, what we want to do, essentially what we want to achieve is a cloud native business automation where we have a knowledge, a knowledge as a service approach. So we have our workflow, we have our decision, we have automatic mathematical optimization, and we also have definitely machine learning because uh, uh, it's not changed only the, uh, let's say, the architecture. So it's not only a, micro a monolith to microservice migration, but uh, it's also changed the way we wanted to automatize our decision, our processes because we have a lot of data, we want to benefit from machine learning to learn from data uh, behavior uh, relation that we are not able or it's hard to explain with a rule or with a process. 
and we want to mix because of course maybe you wanted to use a neural network to classify uh, maybe your your image but then on top of it maybe you wanted to decide okay based on the 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 object that i recognize on the image i want to perform some action so the the goal is of, to obtain a, to obtain a setup that where you can take your knowledge your business logic only your business logic so uh, the problem i want to solve and uh, provide it as a service but to provide it as a service it's not enough just to take the process and uh, move it to production i mean you have a lot of additional problem that you need to solve uh, for example, when the service is in production, you need to monitor, you need to trace, understand what's going on, because maybe your system is starting to behave in a behaving in a different in a way that maybe it was not supposed to work. And definitely you also need explainability because as soon as you started to use machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithms always provide an answer. So uh, if even a Maybe you trained your model starting from a training set that now is completely different to the real data that you have in the real world. And you definitely need to understand if the model is still behaving correctly or even worse, maybe you trained your model, but now the customer uh, provide data that are outlier. So are not really known by, this, by the model. And you needed to, real, to recognize uh, that this decision maybe has been provided in a, is, is not correct, or maybe just the fact that the model is not properly matching this behavior. To do this uh, additional capability, uh, we created this uh, Trust AI initiative. So we wanted to offer value added services for business automation to cover this gap and uh, make those kind of capability really available and really usable in a real world in a production system. So we want to provide the runtime monitoring, both from a system, from a DevOps perspective and from a business perspective. Because uh, in general, when we discuss about the microservice uh, monitoring, uh, we are mainly interested in, uh, okay, I want to see if my system is uh, up and running, how many pods I have, and that kind of stuff. But also business monitoring is really important. I want to have tracing and accountability because out of the data I have uh, from the decision from a process, I want to be sure the internal step that has been performed for a compliance perspective. We have a lot of regulation that need to be satisfied if you think about the GDPR and stuff like that in Europe, but not only. And explainable service is really important because especially when you use uh, uh, prediction uh, machine learning algorithm. So if you want to have, uh, let's say, a simple diagram to explain this uh, in, pic in a picture, we have uh, the, the Cogito Runtime ecosystem. Uh, it's formed by a lot of different services. So we have the Cogito application itself that contains the process, the decision, uh, and it's what actually the user write. But uh, for example, maybe the, this application need to communicate with an external system. And uh, now this kind of communication are mainly done via reactive messaging. At the same time, I could have uh, some stateful information like a job, like uh, a trigger, like a, um, yeah, like a timeout that I need to schedule. So I wanted to have a job service. I would like to perform advanced query on my data. So I would like to have indexing and I have data index. But, and then I have all the services that I already introduced. So I have my business monitoring dashboard. I have the trusted service that collect trace event and reach them. And then I have my explainable service that uh, provide explainability. Let's start simple with uh, the dashboard because uh, it's probably the most straightforward. In a DevOps monitoring, it's nothing new. We have a Grafana dashboard. We can see yeah, how many requests I have, latency. I can see number of requests and number of errors. Business monitoring is similar, but the kind of information that you provide are completely different. So for example, you want to see how many automatically processed requests have uh, compared to the number of uh, manually processed. And maybe you see that the system is uh, having some different behavior because you compare it is uh, compared to the last day and the value are completely different. But to proceed now with, uh, to, uh, with uh, presenting, it's probably easier to introduce a use case. So the use case that we want to consider, it's a quite simple and straightforward, or it's credit card approval. So the use case is I have my case worker that is in front of my end, uh, in front of my end user, and they, the end user is, uh, is asking for a credit card. But the system, the backend system that the, uh, the case worker is using is saying that, no, you cannot have it. And actually, as case worker, I would like to have any, some 
explainability information so I can uh, tell the end user, okay, uh, sorry, but we cannot give you a credit card because of this and that. At the same time, we would like to provide to the user additional information like, okay, uh, we cannot give you the credit card now, but if you are able to, for example, provide uh, an additional guarantor, or if you are able to improve uh, your situation, adding uh, some properties. So we would like to provide information, really real, let's say, action item that the end user can take so that uh, is happy about the decision. So, I mean, he's not happy, of course, to uh, uh, not have the credit card, but at least understand the reason. So we presented the, tra the, the tracing uh, data and we have a tracing UI so that, okay, we have uh, this uh, case worker that is looking at the, the, the decision that has been taken. And uh, as, as first, I can see that, uh, sorry, but this decision, this uh, credit card has not been approved and also the level of confidence of this decision. So at first, uh, I can at least uh, query the information and the internal decision that has been taken by the system. Uh, additionally, I can drill down and I can start to get some explainable information. So the first explainable information that we are able to provide is uh, the feature importance. So we can uh, weight each uh, the each feature and uh, we can uh, show we can let's say uh, recognize uh, which feature had uh, a most positive or negative impact on the decision. So in this case we can see that children had a positive impact for the approval of course uh, while age uh, as had not. So at least I can, uh, this is already an information that it's useful and uh, it's also, let's say, simple for uh, the case worker to explain because this is what I have. This is what uh, what the user provi provided to me. And uh, okay, sorry, but uh, uh, definitely uh, your uh, age situation is not something, is not, uh, is not uh, let's say, good. Of course, age is not something the user can change, but at the same time, it's important to have this kind of information so I can explain my decision. To better understand what explainability is uh, and uh, let's say classify different approaches and proceed with uh, the example based uh, explanation, I will uh, let uh, Tommaso continue the, the presentation. Thanks, Daniele. So uh, as you just mentioned, uh, we uh, we want to uh, understand as end users uh, what happened, uh, why a certain decision has been taken. Uh, but uh, just before uh, going deeper into that, let's try to understand what what are the the main goals. What, why do we have explainability in first place? So uh, the the main goal is uh, that we want to establish trust in automated business processes where uh, models, uh, decision models, machine learning models, any kind of black boxes uh, uh, is, is involved. Um, in order to do that, uh, we would like to um, have uh, um, our decision making to be as transparent as possible. And this is, of course, a challenge because uh, uh, with, uh, with different uh, models, especially with machine learning, uh, models are uh, most of the time uh, opaque, are not transparent, and, uh, and therefore explainability is a, is a kind of uh, um, uh, what we need in order to make those, those uh, black box models more transparent and let us understand uh, at the fine grain uh, why uh, specific predictions are as they are, uh, meaning uh, why, for example, my credit card request has not been uh, approved, or uh, on the other end, uh, more coarse-grained uh, understanding about the behaviors of a certain model, like uh, uh, from a global uh, global perspective. Uh, so why, in general, a certain model tend to say uh, favor um, um, uh, predictions or to approve uh, requests to a credit card uh, when there are cer uh, under certain circumstances, meaning with uh, certain sets of inputs. And on the other end, one thing that the, an enabler um, uh, explainability is also an enabler for accountability because uh, with explainability, especially for, um, uh, for with global explainability, we, we can track changes in model behavior across versions of a, of a certain model. 
meaning a certain de decision model, machine learning model, or whatever kind of uh, black box function that uh, is involved in decisions that impact our end users. Uh, but um, to make some distinction uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, different aspects, uh, let's try to clarify. So uh, a model in, is transparent when, when uh, it's easy to understand. When you look at, 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 the, at the model internals, uh, you can see uh, why the prediction, uh, whether the credit card has been approved or, uh, or rejected uh, and so forth. So it's uh, uh, very intuitive for an end user for an informed end user to understand uh, uh, the inner workings of, of such a model. Uh, on the other end, uh, a model, uh, the expl explanation is a, is a sort of interface. It's, uh, it helps us when the, our model is not as transparent as we would like it to be. Uh, so it works as a um, accurate, uh, let's say, interface between the model and humans in order to understand how they work. And, and in the end, uh, a model is trustworthy when, uh, thanks either uh, to uh, its transparency or its explainability or the capability of another system to explain such a model, uh, the model is considered trustworthy, meaning that uh, humans are confident that the, the model is working as intended and there is no, no surprises, let's say. Um, going uh, slightly in, more into the uh, practi uh, practical um, use case, uh, of course, uh, there are um, uh, different things that you can do. Uh, and uh, uh, the right explanation need to be needs to be provided to the right stakeholder because of the, of the um, background of the, of the involved stakeholder. So for example, a caseworker like the one that needs to explain why a certain um, decision has been taken by the by the system uh, needs to work with with the end with the end user he has very good domain knowledge but on a case by case basis meaning that uh, he or she had a, a, a long history of uh, um, stories with uh, with end users and uh, as th that's uh, his his or her knowledge but on the other end, uh, doesn't have a, any technical, or this, he, he or she is not expected to have uh, technical knowledge. On the other end, there can be other users, like the compliance worker, let's say a higher level um, um, stakeholder that takes care more of uh, business, uh, um, uh, business objectives, uh, compliance with regulations, and so forth. Uh, he has, as well, good high level domain knowledge, but from a different perspective. Uh, so it, it doesn't probably know a case by case uh, uh, the, how the the system reacts uh, with respect to different um, different end users, and uh, but has a kind of a, a more high level abstract knowledge of the domain, and doesn't have any technical knowledge, or at least it's not expected to have. Uh, whereas there is this the data data scientist, which is far from the users. Uh, he has no, or at least has limited knowledge of the of the domain, and has good technical knowledge. And for each of these users, um, uh, there uh, there has to be uh, the right explanation in order to better work with with such models. For example, for the case worker who needs uh, explanation on a case by case basis to support end users, uh, local explanations are good. And local explanation are explanations that relate to single predictions, to single decisions uh, uh, being made by the system. Uh, whereas the compliance worker with needs explanation from a higher level perspective in order to understand if the um, system uh, and the uh, model involved in the decision are in line with regulations and business objectives uh, can more benefit uh, from a global explanation that uh, um, seeks to explain uh, how the, the a model is behaving from a, a more general perspective. And on the other end, there is a data scientist, with, data scientist who can benefit from both because he needs probably to understand uh, if the model behavior is in line with, with uh, the requirements is being given uh, and also uh, might need to debug um, issues and uh, outlier cases and so forth. So for um, the rest of this talk, uh, we will focus uh, more on the case worker. 
and on local explanations. Uh, so as uh, Daniel was mentioning, we have uh, uh, the end user that, that has, uh, um, has requested a credit card and uh, say it has been uh, rejected. Uh, so uh, the caseworker, what the, the caseworker can do uh, with respect to the end user is, is it explaining why um, uh, such a credit card has been re uh, rejected. In order to do so, uh, let's say we uh, look under the, uh, the backend system and we have both the black box model and an explanation service. The explanation service um, uh, works together with the black box model, interacts with the black box model in order to provide such an answer for the end user. And in order to answer uh, to, to this why question, um, uh, the, the, the case worker uh, can benefit from uh, using these explanations called silence explanations, which give featured importance scores for a single decision, a single predictions. Uh, and these, these explanations uh, respond to the need, uh, to, to, this, to the inquiry like, which inputs does the model give more importance to uh, when deciding whether uh, uh, granting the credit card or not? In this specific case, the value of children uh, plays a positive role for granting the credit card, whereas the value of age plays a negative role for granting the credit card. And as a case of worker, you can already um, imagine uh, that this can uh, arise uh, uh, even some questions, uh, because, um, for example, in this specific case, it might it might be okay uh, to uh, that the model is giving a very uh, high um, uh, importance uh, to features like chil number of children and uh, and the age and age, but in other domains that might uh, um, raise uh, fairness concerns. And um, because uh, of course you would not, you don't want your model, your decision service, uh, to be uh, to discriminate uh, among uh, uh, different classes of users. Uh, so in order to do so, let's get it slightly more technical. Um, uh, we use uh, um, uh, we leverage um, uh, an algorithm called Lime from from the paper that is mentioned here. And we adapted this uh, uh, this algorithm to the case, also uh, basically to work uh, with any uh, black box model, meaning also to work with uh, uh, decision the decision services, not just machine learning models um, involving, for example, DMN decision tables and so forth. Uh, so, so what the, what Lime does is test what happens to the prediction when you provide. Uh, um, perturbed uh, variations of the input to the black box model. So it changes slightly um, the features in order to see what happens. What, what are the features that uh, are um, more important? And uh, in order to do so, it trains an interpretable model like a linear classifier to say, separate perturbed data points by the, by the label. Uh, and the label again is given uh, by the black box model. So that's why the explanation service need to interact with the black, black box model. And finally, the weights of the linear model are used to uh, as feature importance scores. And by the way, this is uh, included in, uh, uh, will be included in Cogito uh, 0.15 uh, that is scheduled to, for middle September. But now let, let's get it uh, a bit further. Uh, so now I, uh, as an end user, I know why, but then how, what, what can I do? Uh, how can I process this information, this explanation in order to, uh, um, to get satisfied and get my credit card? Uh, so again, uh, in order to do so, um, uh, the caseworker queries the explanation service. And uh, the need of the caseworker is, uh, to understand what the user should change in order to get, to get the credit card, but still uh, not having a completely uh, different profile. Uh, so, and uh, the explanation, uh, the kind of explanation that is useful in these cases uh, um, is the ex ex exemplar explanation type. Uh, such explanation are still local explanation for single predictions, 
uh, but are um, provided by means of examples. So uh, in the input space, like uh, uh, features, say. Uh, specifically for this need, counterfactual explanations are what we need. Um, basically, they provide examples that have the desired prediction. So in this case, uh, the, the credit card has been approved, uh, but are as close as possible to the original input. So this answers the question, how should the user change its inputs in order to get a formally rejected credit card request granted? Um, to get a high level understanding of how counterfactual explanations work, uh, we can, uh, let's say, summarize them as uh, uh, being uh, uh, implemented as a minim minimization problem of uh, two cost functions. The first cost, first cost function relates to the inputs and represent the distance between the original input and the new input to be generated, the counterfactual explanation. And the other um, cost function, which is the target cost, representing the distance between uh, the desired output, which is credit card approved, and the output generated by the black box, black box model on the new input, which is the counterfactual explanation. So if you think about it, um, we, uh, we, that could be done uh, by uh, sampling, I don't know, uh, an infinite number of, of, uh, of inputs. Uh, and of course, this would be a huge search space, especially when, when there are high dimensional inputs, numerical features involved. And of course, there is also the problem of out, out of distribution. Like I, uh, I, would, I could sample uh, an input that is completely unrelated to a real like age, I don't know, 1000, uh, 1, completely unrelated to real life. Um, and other things like our constraints make the problem works. Like, uh, what should I change? So if the system tells me that I should uh, be younger, well, I cannot go back in time. So that's a problem. And with this, I would hand over to Rui for the demo. Thank you, Tomasa. Share my screen. Right. So thank you, Tomas. So, uh, so today uh, I'd like to show a simple demo which calculates counterfactuals for a given predicted model using OptiPlanner. And the use case uh, is the one that was mentioned previously. It's one of credit card approvals. And the predictive model used will take an applicant's information as its input, and it will generate a prediction on whether the application should be approved or declined. And we'll explain the next slides of the model is trained. And the interaction uh, will be performed by a REST server built on top of Quarkus, which exposes three endpoints. So a predict endpoint, which simply uh, gives the approval prediction given the applicant's information, a counterfactual endpoint, which returns a counterfactual for a given input, and a breakdown endpoint, which returns a breakdown of the OptiPlanner score associated with a counterfactual. And uh, I've mentioned that, well, this use case revolves around credit card applications, and the purpose of this model is not to be comprehensive, or even as Tommaso mentioned, fair, but rather to give a non-trivial illustration of how different components relate. So the principles used for this uh, particular demo can then be applied and generalized to even more complex models. And having said that, we can look at the data set that we use to train the model, and that includes applicant information variables, such as the age of the applicant, uh, income, uh, the number of children they have, number of days in the current employment, and whether the applicant uh, owns any realty or if they have a work phone or have their own car. And the data included tries to capture some of the distributions you might expect to see in the real world for, for these variables like age, income, days of employment. And it also includes different types of features that you might encounter in non-trivial models, namely, uh, continuous and discrete numerical variables, as well as categorical variables. So all of these variables will have a contribution to the outcome, which was simulated. And for the purposes of the demo, we, we decided to increase the probability of the approval with age, and higher incomes will also have an increase, uh, will also increase the probability of an approval. So it's possible, for instance, that the young high earner will have a higher likelihood of approval than an older low earner. 
And a higher number of family dependents will decrease the probability of an approval. And the more days you have at the current job, the higher the probability of approval. And finally, the last three fields are categorical, and they also increase the probability of approval, in, although with, with a smaller weight. And to train the model, we have chosen a random forest classifier. And we have used uh, Python's uh, scikit learning framework to train the model. And after the model was trained, we serialized it to PNML so that it could be embedded in our Quarkus REST server. And it's important to note, as uh, Tommaso and, and Daniela mentioned before, that um, when we created the predictive model in this way, we'll also consider it from now on as a black box model for demo purposes. That is to say, we'll make no assumptions about uh, how the model works internally, and we'll only interact with its interface. So we know the input types, and we know what the model will give out, the prediction, but we'll build all the rest of the counterfactual system, ignoring what happens inside the box. So we'll pretend we don't know. And this is also one of the advantages of using black box approach, is that we're decoupling the system from the actual machine learning uh, stack that was used. So as far as the system is concerned, the model could be anything from a regression to or, or a neural network. It could, be, it could be, actually be anything. So what is our criteria to find a counterfactual? So let's assume we have a specific applicant with an associated uh, data, which requests for a credit card, and the model predicts that the credit card should be, that the request should be declined. So as was explained previously as well, a non-technical user is interested in finding out what is the closest input to the one we just provided, which returns an approval. That is, what can be changed from the initial application so that the credit card uh, application is approved? For instance, if we have a model with a single variable, let's consider age for a second, we could be trying to find which is the age closest to the applicants which would return an approval. So an approval is what we call the goal in our case. And there are several ways in which you could find the counterfactual. So we could, for instance, but shouldn't definitely, use a brute force approach. Uh, we, we could search this multidimensional space and select the points which are closer to the original ones and say, this is a counterfactual. But just going back to the example where we just considered one single variable, the age, we would simply, in this case, evaluate the model for each possible age and find the closest one to the applicants that will give an approval. Now, obviously, this is not feasible especially for very large search spaces with potentially a large number of variables. Um, we could use other methods like, for instance, numerical optimization methods and try to minimize the input distance. But again, just looking at the case where we have a single variable, the age, we will just try to minimize the difference between the applicant's age and the current age where we're evaluating, and then we'll see when we get an approval. This could work, However, we'll have to deal with several new problems. Uh, for instance, one will be, how do we incorporate different types of features like uh, categorical variables? How can we declare very complex constraints? All sorts of, of problems like this. So we could extend this numerical solution we just built from scratch and try to add features to express complex constraint relationships, add uh, features to deal with complex data types, However, in doing so, we will be just reinventing the wheel and possibly be making a lot of mistakes along the way. So we talked about complex constraints. So we, what constraints are we, are we talking about, really? So even though we're trying to find a solution close to the original inputs, uh, some variable changes might not be very helpful, and Tommaso mentioned some. For instance, it wouldn't be very helpful to tell an applicant that he could have a credit card if he changed his age. So uh, we could say, well, if you were younger, you would have the application, or if you were older, or if you change the number of children you have. So it could be a, a valid solution, but not a very helpful one. And as such, we might want to add additional constraints in our search. For instance, we want solutions which minimize the changes in inputs, but that we've certain, uh, certain inputs in change, such as in, in our example, age and number of children. So since this can be considered, and it is a kind of constraint solving problem, we should use the best tools we have at our disposal. And that's why for this problem, 
we, we've chosen to apply optic binary. So optic binary is the next one too to calculate these types of solutions to these problems. It is a battle-tested constraint solver which can efficiently find answers to NP hard problems. And we we also can ex ex uh, express complaint constraints fluently using any JVM language. It includes a variety of search algorithms and this allows us to focus on the import important parts of uh, the counterfactual problem, that is, how to quantify what is the best counterfactual rather than trying to reinvent complex search domain algorithms. So there are lots of use cases which are very, very uh, uh, famous and popular for OptiBiner. So we just thought of, of showing this uh, this new application, this new use case for which OptiBiner could be used. And it also includes capabilities which are useful for for dealing with machine learning models, such as uh, exploration of the score itself to better understand why a counterfactual was chosen, and as well as other utilities like benchmarking, and so we can choose between different approaches and, and try to gauge what's the best method for our current, uh, current problem. So since we're using OptiBiner, how can, be, how can the counterfactual be expressed as an actual OptiBiner problem? So we start by defining uh, our score of what is the best counterfactual. And we use a bendable score in this case. We use a bendable score with two hard score levels and one soft score level. And the primary hard score level corresponds to our main predictive goal. That is, we want to avoid all solutions for which the prediction is different from the goal. As an example, I mean, we're just trying to find an approval and we want to avoid all the inputs that, resu that result in an application being declined. So we just, we're gonna penalize the, the, the solution through which uh, the application is declined. The secondary hard score level relates to what we just mentioned about the constrained variables, the age and number of children. We want to penalize uh, solutions which have to change these constraint fields. And at the soft score level, we're going to use the distance between the features themselves as a score. And in this case, it was calculated as a square of the Manhattan distance, but it, you can use pretty much any other uh, feature distance measure that, that, that you want. And just a note about the art score, we could have excluded solutions which break our constraints from the search space. However, there are some good reasons to include them. We might be interested in solutions which are feasible which are not feasible, sorry, but they could provide additional information about the model. For instance, uh, we, we could search for a counterfactual and, and just say we, we haven't found any counterfactual, or we could search for a counterfactual and say, we found a counterfactual, but the only way we got there was by changing these two fields. There is no other way that a, cre a credit card uh, uh, application would be approved if you hadn't changed the age or the number of children. And that is still valid information, it's still informative, about uh, the model that we are using. It gives us an insight about the actual model. So how does this work at the implementation level? So at the implementation level, we declare the constraints using OptiPlanner's streaming API. And the streaming API also gives us the benefit that it will later on provide us a clear breakdown of the score, which we will use on, on the REST server. And an important part of this implementation is how do we declare the boundaries of our search space. So we use OptiPlanner value range providers and the boundaries used arise from the main specific knowledge. That means we're not using any uh, boundaries calculated from the actual training data set or the data set that's been associated with a certain model. And there are two reasons for that. One of them is that it might be entirely possible that the counterfactual that we find falls outside the values that already exist in the training data. And this is quite interesting since it means that, for instance, in this particular case, we don't need to, to have uh, the actual training data to calculate the, the, the counterfactual. And this is just some examples of, of some uh, boundaries that we use. We try to use, this is not really the main specific knowledge, we can call it just common sense. So we just use, for instance, for ages, we consider the range of 18 to 100. We search annual incomes between zero and 1 million and number of children between zero and 20 and days of the current job between zero and the equivalent of 50 years in the same job. And the other var variables are just categorical, so we just use binary true or false. 
And so once we've defined our entity, the credit card application, our solution and our scoring along with the constraints, we're ready to use OptiPoint to find counterfactuals. So in the REST server under the hood, when we get a set of inputs, we set it as our original inputs, a kind of problem fact. And OptiPointer will then start the construction heuristics. And during the score evaluation, the predictive model will be called to return the outcome prediction for the current planning entity. And this result will be used to calculate the primary hard score, as we've seen before. So all of the other score components can be calculated using the original input and do not need to interact with the predictive model any further. And since this is OptiPointer, obviously, as I mentioned, we can explore different construction heuristics and search strategies and compare them in a systematic way. So we can choose the best approach for our individual problem. And if you want to see uh, which one we use specifically for this demo, you can just check out the, the code on, 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 on the repo. So without any further ado, I'll just show you uh, quickly how this works in practice. So the first thing we do is just start up the REST server. And, okay, it's done. Okay, and we're gonna start with this application. So you're gonna consider a quite young applicant, he's 20 years old. He has an income that we've chosen to be well below the median of the incomes we have on our data set, so 50,000 per year. He has no children, he's in place for 100 days, he has no realty, he has a work phone, and he has his own car. So we tested this We tested this beforehand, so we know this is gonna be a rejection, but let's just ask the REST server to predict what will be the credit card application in this case. And, okay, here we go. So as expected, it's not gonna be approved, and the model actually tells us with some extra information saying, I can tell you with a confidence of 72%, that this, mod, that this application is not going to be approved. Now, if we take this data and put it to the counterfactual endpoint and ask, so what would need to be changed on this uh, application so that this person will get a credit card? And hopefully, we will get a counterfactual for this prediction that maintains the age and the number of children unchanged. So we just set a hard limit to the search of 30 seconds, and that's purely because of time constraints for the, for the demo. Uh, we, we could have tried to run it for longer, but let's see what the answer is. All right, so, okay, so here we go. So the server is telling us that if this person earned almost 100,000 per year, and if it was employed for almost 2,000 days, then this application would be approved. Okay, so that's quite good to know. So let's take the counterfactual and actually try to predict on a counterfactual. So, okay, here we go. So if this was the application, we will get an approval for the credit card, and this time we will get it with a probability, with a confidence, sorry, of being 55% approved. <clears throat> and this actually makes sense that it's such a close probability because we're not trying to find which data is gonna definitely give this person uh, a, a credit card. We're trying to find the closest one to the original, which was a rejection, that will give it uh, an approval. So it's gonna be quite close to the threshold. Now, what happens if we take a kind of nonsense application? So we know this is gonna fail for sure. So you're gonna have a person with 10 years old, they have 10 children, they don't work, they don't have any income. So we know this is gonna fail. But the interesting thing is, the model is not gonna find any kind of approval that's anywhere near close to this because it just doesn't exist. So it will have to change one of these fields. So let's ask the server, what would be the counterfactual for, for this case? So just wait a few more seconds. Okay. Here we go. So 
Optoplanner is telling us, well, we did find a counterfactual, but this is a distance from the features. So you can see it's quite a large distance. You actually had to walk a long way to find a counterfactual. And it had to change the age. So there was no way I could find a counterfactual if I hadn't changed the age. Because obviously, it even, it even takes part of our search boundaries that we don't even consider people with 10 years old. We just start considering the late So it had to change. And this is still valuable information about the, it's a valuable insight about the model. And this concludes my part of the demonstration. So thank you very much. And now I'll just hand over to Daniele that will just give some final remarks. Okay. So, so let, let me just try to summarize uh, what we presented today. First, we started introducing Cogito that enable business automation uh, on uh, cloud in the cloud environment. Then we presented Trust AI initiative that adds value-added services on top of Cogito to enable tracing, explainability, and monitoring. Then we go essentially. We started to introduce, okay, what explainability is? And explainability is needed to establish trust, trust in uh, automated business processes. And one of the possible explanations we can provide is that uh, it's uh, simple and it's also, let's say, uh, user-oriented, it's contrafactual explanation. Provide uh, this, ex uh, this exp uh, explanation. Okay. Uh, this explanation let the user obtain the desired result. So you can demo what need to be done to obtain the desired result. And to do or to obtain all of these, uh, we uh, were able to use OptaPlanner because it's a really powerful and flexible constraint solver that can be applied also to, let's say, non-traditional constraint problem. So we were able to score using OptaPlanner to score a prediction. And actually, what we obtained at the end was to do an optimization problem, to solve an optimization problem on top of the, on top of the prediction. So the result of that is that uh, we, the prediction is not the final output. We can do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot more on top of it. At the moment, we just started with uh, this uh, this contrafactual explanation using OptoPlanner, but the reality is that we can enrich, we can explain decision, and then we can use those information again to enrich the final decision. So, for example, in a, we can let's say starting from a, a, a new solution that has been provided, and maybe directly suggest this to the uh, to the end user. So. We can enrich the logic, uh, and we can have a really powerful decision uh, automation and business automation solution, combining different type of uh, AI. Last part, uh, resources. OK, we have a Cogito website, of course. We have a couple of blog posts where we introduce Trust AI. Then, of course, we share the code. Uh, and uh, finally, we have a link to if you are more if you are interested on example based explanation that you can that you can use. Thank you. And uh, question. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniele, Tommaso, Rui. Uh, yes, we do have a question from Simone Libera, and. Uh, the question is, can you please explain why did you choose Lime instead of Shape for model explanation? And I'd like to add to this question because we might have people on the chat who doesn't really know what Lime stands for. So please just talk a little bit about it and why did you choose it? Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll, I will take this one. So, um, LIME stands for Local Interpreter Model Agnostic Explanations. And uh, we did some research uh, before um, uh, coming to choose LIME. And uh, of course, we also um, uh, evaluated SHAP. Uh, the reason why we, uh, we chose LIME is that uh, in our experimentation and research, um, LIME was uh, uh, more lightweight in terms of computation. And this is uh, uh, important, uh, especially when you have when you work with uh, end users. So for local explanations, uh, we found out that it was uh, more lightweight and also it was um, easier to um, uh, to tweak it uh, to work uh, also with uh, 
TMN models, basically decision tables and other kind of uh, uh, of models. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, it's just uh, where we started. Uh, we might also embrace other algorithms going going forward. Yeah, this was just uh, the the first algorithm that we implemented, so that we were able to uh, approach local explanation problem, and we were able to provide uh, an answer that is uh, let's say human readable. Uh, we wanted to we are we plan to uh, start to work on global explanation too, and of course at that point uh, Sharp and other algorithms will yeah, be considered too. The one of the uh, one of the points that we are uh, considering is always to try to start considering the persona, so the, the, the use case that we want to, to approach. And instead of generate, let's say, instead of taking all the algorithms that we are able to find and provide back the result, try to understand if we're able to provide uh, meaningful information that are easy to, easy to be understood and how to display, how to interact with it. So part of the, the, part of the decision uh, behind the... Uh, uh, the decision logic behind uh, choosing an algorithm or another one is also based on that, considering the, the use case that we are uh, approaching. Yeah, the other point I wanted to to mention is that the implementation wise, uh, it was uh, uh, let's say uh, it's more model agnostic uh, line in terms of uh, also the implementation, uh, whereas uh, Sharp uh, in terms of implementation to make it slightly faster with uh, it has a different implementation for trees, so the, I mean, the, there are also some kind of uh, more technical uh, constraints. Yeah, this is a good part because uh, we started considering black box, uh, uh, we started considering uh, the problem from a black box perspective. So we don't want to, we decided not to implement a, a specific mechanism for a random forest from neural network, because there are of course uh, uh, a lot of uh, explainability uh, techniques uh, specific on starting from the algorithm. So we decided to start from a completely black box agnostic mechanism, and that's the reason. Perfect, thank you. Wow, wow, you just rocked it. Yeah, let me bring the guys to stage. Hey, Duncan, hey, Geoffrey, how are you? Really great presentation, I really yeah. like it. <laughs> I'm just happy that we warned everybody uh, before the start of this uh, this day that the, the last one would be the super duper technical deep dive thing. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that wow. was awesome. That was awesome. Really impressive. Yeah, we, we tried to start high level and then going deeper and deeper, and uh, at the end, they reached the code. So yeah, yeah, that, that was it. People were able to to follow the presentation. Of it was course, fantastic. If, uh, really nice. Yeah, if you don't know, let's say the topic at all. Uh, it could be hard to start from scratch and uh, from zero to zero, like in one hour. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, but the good thing is that if people want to just like get in touch and discuss each of those topics in detail, they can find uh, all, they can find us on the Zolip chat, uh, which I've shared with you previously. And before we just chat a little bit, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about the agenda of tomorrow. Would you mind, guys? Can I? Good. You're, you're the host. You're cool. So if you're attending today, you are more than welcome to be here uh, tomorrow, uh, the second day of the OptoPlanner week at September 2nd. So we will start at 10 a.m. EST, which is 4 p.m. CEST. C -E -S -T, and uh, we will start with uh, Donato Marazzo, which is uh, this guy's brilliant. Uh, we, he will talk about uh, task optimization with chained models, followed by Go Justin Goldsmith, who actually implemented real solutions in customers. He's a, 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 an architect in the Red Hat services team uh, with a real solid background, as everyone else in here. But it's cool to, to have like different perspectives, people from the product team, engineers, from sales, from services, it's really nice to see these different perspectives. Different regions we, as well, Karina. Uh, both EMEA, Donato covering EMEA, uh, Justin uh, covering North America. So also there, there might be slight differences in approaches. So also good to see that. That is that is right, Duncan. And uh, we will wrap up, and uh, we need to be warmed up before that with Lukash talking Lukash talking about constraint streams. 
and it's uh, he he was he was going to talk about how to get started, but then I told him you can go a little bit more deep. So let's see how that's going to to flow, right? So it's a super technical deep dive getting started. That's going to be interesting. Looking oh, forward no. to that one. <laughs> I'm also very looking forward to that. All three actually. Um, so yeah, the, the not the stock on talk assi task assignments on chain variables. That's really uh, you know another. Uh, an easy topic, but a really useful topic. And and Justin will show a little bit of gerrymandering, which is always fun. So all of you who don't live in the US, gerrymandering you might not know about, but it's a way to uh, change the elections in your favor, basically. And he'll talk about anti-gerrymandering, so doing, doing the good fight, making sure that nobody uh, tries to cheat the elections, more or less. Um, uh, it's a very interesting case. Uh, uh, and and look at the 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 the, uh, the, um, the constraint streams, all of the constructs there, all of the things were planned, and the things we were already doing there. Um, it's it's they're going to be become very very powerful, and it's going to be much easier to write certain constraints. It already is, but it's going to go much much further even, and it's it's very nice that's what's going on there. I look forward to all talks. So guys, let me say something. We are about to wrap up our day and I'd like to ask you to say a few words before we wrap up to everyone who's watching us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it up to you and then I'll wrap up the day. So Duncan, uh, please share your last words. Like Duncan, we try. My last and final words. Yeah, no, that's fine. that's very that's very easy uh, because uh, uh, like uh, a number of uh, people's uh, uh, number of guys and and girls here uh, uh, presenting, uh, I'm very used to traveling across the world and present uh, our technology to uh, uh, people and users and developers and architects in person, um, and it's crazy times at the moment, and we have to do this all virtually. And I just want to say and uh, a big thanks and and plus kudos for Karina for pulling this off, hosting this, organizing this, and extremely well done. Um, and yeah, and a, a lot of fun to uh, to participate. So those uh, plus kudos for you, Karina. Thank you, Duncan. What about you, Rui? Rui, you, we are just seeing your eyebrows, man. We want to see your face. Come on, <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> Yay! What are your le your final words, Rui, for everyone who's watching us? Amar, Edwin, Benjamin, uh, Luca, Terry, Karsten, everyone who's here. What do you want to say to them? Rui, you don't want to say anything? No, okay. Rui is on mute. <laughs> shy, he's shy. No, he's not shy. <laughs> no, I'm not shy, I'm on mute. <laughs> Or I'm shy. Yeah, and different I'm, concept, same outcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say to everyone to come over tomorrow and check out uh, the second day. I and mean, definitely I'll do it. Uh, it's a great way to learn new stuff. And it's exciting times, yeah. So new applications for things. And this project we did was lots of fun and, and very interesting. And uh, yeah, everyone keep safe. Thank and you, Rui. You still have time to ask questions. So we are wrapping up the day, but if you have that last question, you, you just drop it on the chat. I'm looking to it, okay? So Tommaso, your final words. Well, uh, I want to thank everyone that uh, uh, made uh, this uh, this possible. Uh, thanks my co-speakers. Uh, it was, uh, first of all, a fun effort. And also thanks uh, you, the organizers, uh, for such a great content and uh, also for a, a very uh, great tool and, uh, and project. Thank you, Tommaso, for the great presentation. Daniele Sonka, tell me, what's in your head, Daniele? <laughs> Also, Tommaso is Italian, so if you want to joke, you uh, no. <laughs> I, I, had, I had hope I, I could skip this. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that I have any specific to, to add. Uh, it was really nice to have this, uh, this virtual event. Of course, 
uh, event in person are definitely better because they are engaging. You can discuss uh, uh, with people also outside the, the session, but uh, uh, considering the current situation, I think that uh, we are doing, you are doing the best. <laughs> and uh, thanks for the for, for having us, I mean, also for accepting us. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Daniele. Oh, the planner is superb. <laughs> so, uh, Geoffrey, our Opta Planner lead, please wrap up the day with your final words for people who's watching us. All right, so first, big thanks to you, of course, Karina, for organizing this and for all of your work you've done for this and just for brilliant hosting. Thanks, everybody, for the presentations. I liked all and they were all great. Um, um, you know, um, really interesting, by the way, Danielle is in team, your last presentation, Duncan, your presentation this morning, uh, earlier just today, just rocked. Um, and of course, here in Christopher's too. Um, I don't know what to say, just join us tomorrow. It will be very interesting, I think. Um, and we have plenty more content coming. Um, and um, any features, any questions you have, bring them on the chat, uh, start asking them, um, we'll look into them and uh, use cases and so forth. Um, and I, I love to see more and more uh, planning use cases. And we just planning problems are everywhere. And it's sometimes amazing on, on how many times, uh, how many different ways we can apply them. So for example, today I learned you can apparently use OptoPlanner on a PMML black box model <laughs> to actually uh, find counterfactual ex examples. I didn't know that. So that was very interesting to learn. Thanks guys. Pretty nice. And the coolest thing is that OptoPlanner is an open source project. So you can actually see all the code you can contribute. You can uh, be part of this project. Uh, feel free to submit any suggestions, any issues you find and get in touch with the team. Everyone is uh, open at the Zulip chat. And uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. And uh, let's see us. Uh, let's talk again tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Daniele, Rui, Tommaso. And thank you. I'll see you tomorrow at the Opta Planner Week, day two. Bye bye. <laughs>